Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Kyoka Jira was kidnapped by villain Deku, and she falls in love with him, movie? So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, Killing Harvest, link is in the description, also subscribe to our channel, and like this video, so let's begin the video. Fear that was what Izuku felt right now. It was of course the rational fear of dying. I mean name how many people die from being drowned and suffocated in living sludge. Yea not many. As Izuku tried in vain to claw himself out he was beginning to lose all of his senses. As he started to lose feeling in his limbs Izuku could feel his body go numb. Then he felt his eyes start to go as the color drained from his vision and turned to black. Then his hearing was shot, leaving the last thing he heard to be the taunts from the slime villain. And finally Izuku drifted into unconsciousness as he blacked out. Where am I? Izuku asked himself, hearing a slight echo effect. Looking around he could only see black. All around him there was nothing. Is anybody here? Izuku called out trying to find somebody. But nobody came. Not even a sound, just his own directionless voice that soon died out into silence. Then realization dawned on him. Am I dead? Izuku asked himself, thinking back to the last thing he remembered. Almost instinctively his hand went to feel for a heartbeat. And to his surprise he still had one. But why did that disappoint him more than it should? Was he hoping to die? To leave it and everything he ever knew in all his life for the unknown. Was he willing to leave behind the few things he cared about in this world for what all he knew was this eternal blackness? And strangely to him, that answer was yes. For all his life since he was four he never truly felt anything other than a few things. Pain, sorrow, loneliness, etc. Nothing he ever did helped him. Sure things like his mother helped dull the emotions, but he never felt happy. For all he knew he was probably and most likely suffering from depression. But was that his fault? No of course not. It was everyone else's fault. Kakin, no Bakugu. Bakugo hadn't been his childhood friend or a friend at all for that matter for about 10 years now. It seemed his entire existence was to make his life a living hell. At school, in public, whenever they were near each other that was all he did. And he wanted to be the number one hero. And then the second biggest realization for the day dawned on him. What was Bakugu really? He proudly claimed and boasted that he would become the number one hero. But really now that Izuku thought about it, nothing Bakugo did ever seemed heroic. He didn't offer words of wisdom or help others with their problems. Not all he really ever did was boast that he was all-powerful and that he would surpass all the extras that stood in his way. Now that Izuku thought about it his friend's actions matched those of a villain. That's actually kinda funny now that I think about it. Izuku said to himself sitting down. After all these years, all it had taken was death to open his eyes. And much to Izuku's non-existent surprise, he felt nothing. No shock, no life-crushing pain, and no well, anything really. But even with it he was strangely calm. This blackness whatever it was calmed him. It was comforting oddly, here he felt no pain, no sadness, and no depression. And I always thought death was gonna be painful. Izuku said to himself, recalling how painful living had been. But that was when he heard a noise. A slight moan if you would. As Izuku stood up and turned to face the source of the sound, Izuku stood back. There before him was a corpse. One covered in blood and limbs bent in unnatural angles with eyes just as black as everything around them. But what truly struck a chord in Izuku was who this corpse was. His mother. Dead and seemingly trying to crawl towards him moaning and groaning in an unrecognizable emotion. But seeing this made Izuku feel an emotion he was all too familiar with. Fear. Without realizing it, Izuku's body began to tremble, his hands shaking as he watched the corpse claw its way toward him. Stay back. Izuku said as he took a few more steps back. And right into a wall that came out of nowhere. Turning around Izuku now saw that there was a wall extending infinitely in both and was too tall to climb and he didn't know how far it went in both directions. It was then that he heard more sounds coming from all around him. And as he turned around he froze completely. Now there instead of just the living corpse of his mother, there stood everyone he knew. All bloodied and bent, closing in on him. Stay away. Izuku wanted to yell but found he couldn't. But then another emotion took hold of him at the same time. It was a rush of pure thrill. He was afraid yet he was enjoying this. As he regained control of his muscles he found himself looking down at his hands. And saw that they were covered in blood. And yet this did not disgust him. In fact it captivated him, so much so that he grew oblivious to the coming danger. A million questions ran through his mind as he gazed at his hands. Whose blood was this? Is it mine? How did it get there? Strangely Izuku cracked a smile when he realized something. He didn't care. He didn't care how this blood got here, nor did he care who it was. He didn't even care when he felt his legs get grabbed by a pair of bloody hands. Looking down he saw that the corpses were grabbing him trying to pull him down. 
and he helplessly fell into the sea of corpses. But then the rush ended, and the overwhelming fear returned. Screaming in fear, as hands tried to pull him down into the sea of corpses his body lost all its strength and wouldn't move. Closing his eyes so he wouldn't have to see anything he felt a hand start pulling him up. This hand, he couldn't describe it. It was like it was there, but yet wasn't there at the same time. But what got him more was how high he felt himself being lifted. And then being dropped. Screaming again, and opening his eyes he saw that the corpses and wall had disappeared. Instead in their place stood a lone figure. This thing just stood there still, hunched over its face hidden from view. Its body was, well even hunched over, tall, and lanky. Its limbs are thin, and weak. And it was covered in what Izuku could only guess was burlap. And yet gazing upon this made Izuku gain an emotion he hadn't felt forever. Happiness. The fear all, but completely disappeared from him, as Izuku slowly walked towards the figure. But when he got within just about 10 feet from it it started moving. Elegantly and gracefully it straightened its body and spread its area like a bird spreading its wings. It was then Izuku saw its face. A cold lifeless expression rested upon it. Its eyes matched the emptiness that the corpses had. Its mouth seemed to open as a slight moan escaped its lips. Izuku took a step back. It was then Izuku realized what this thing reminded him of. A scarecrow hanging limp on its post as it resided in the middle of a field. Without realizing it Izuku stared into its eyes, finding them full of emotion rather than the dead and dull eyes of the corpses. But then all hell broke loose. When the scarecrow saw Izuku looking at it, it tore away from its position and lunged at Izuku, throwing him to the ground into a chokehold. As Izuku hacked and coughed for air he found his body trembling. He was yet again afraid. As he screamed the scarecrow removed one hand and tightened the other. As its hand moved through the air towards its head it stopped just above the neck. Then grabbing at the point where the head and neck connected it began to pull away the burlap covering its face. Revealing that of himself. Staring back down upon Izuku was himself. A more older version since he had a more sculpted face. But what got him were the scars his older self had. But the thing he noticed most was that his eyes were different. They were less big and contained only one emotion. Fear. They both were experiencing the same thing. They both were afraid of each other. But, as Izuku screamed, his older self learned its head closer to his, and whispered into his ear. Boo. And then Izuku shot up panting. My boy are you alright? The hulking figure of All Might asked standing over Izuku who was on the ground. What happened? Izuku said quickly, between gasps of air and coughs. Relax. I apologize for getting you wrapped up in my heroin work. All Might said before laughing. But now then I just wanted to make sure you were alright, and this guy didn't hurt you. All Might said, patting the soda bottle with a pair of floating eyes and green gloop inside it. Normally Izuku would be totally going fanboy. But he felt nothing towards All Might right now. All he felt was the shock of what he remembered. So all that was just in my head. Izuku said to himself. Yes you gave me quite the scare, All Might said. You kept screaming and moving in your unconscious state. Anyway I must be off to get this fella to the authorities. All Might said before taking off into the sky, leaving Izuku there on the ground alone. Izuku just sat there, as his mind raced. So that nightmare he had wasn't real. But yet it felt like it was. The feeling of fear. Izuku mumbled to himself. Izuku did eventually drag himself up. As he wandered home he thought about everything that happened in that void. And then he recalled his realizations. That everything he had gone through since he was four. When he got home he saw that his mother wasn't there. Paying no mind assuming she just went out for a bit he decided to do a little research. Going into his room he saw everything in it that was All Might themed. And he began mercilessly tearing them apart. His trash can soon became filled with the shredded contents, as his walls were left blank. As he was about to throw away the action figures that he had an idea sprang into his head. Leaving those for now he sat down at his computer and saw the All Might screens of her. I really am that obsessive huh? Izuku said as he opened up a browser and began looking for a replacement screens of her. But what to choose, he pondered over it. Then his mind drifted back to the scarecrow he saw and decided to look that up. And surprisingly there were plenty of images of scarecrows that were spooky and cool. Finding one he liked he set that as his screens of her and opened a new tab. Fear is complex in the brain. Izuku typed in as a number of medical sites pulled up. Clicking on the first one he soon found himself reading a 10-page long article on what causes a human to be afraid. Apparently the brain perceives the danger and releases a hormone that causes the body to be afraid. Suddenly, as he was reading this a smile crept onto Izuku's lips. So Bakugou you like to make me afraid every waking moment you can, Izuku said to himself chuckling. We'll see how much longer you think my torment is funny. Izuku looked up a chemical site and various other tabs related to the article that he just read. 
Yes he had very little idea on how to use them, but nothing a few months of practice couldn't fix. After all, with what he had planned he was going to leave a gash that would never heal. Getting up from his computer he went to his closet to pull out a duffel bag and a backpack, both non-hero related. Then walking back over to his shelf of still in the box action figures he put them all neatly in the duffel bag. Then he put every piece of necessary non-hero related clothing he had on top of them. Which gave him about three outfits. What else should I bring? Izuku asked himself, as he still had an entire free backpack. Let's see. He had his wallet, clothes, and his merchandise. He couldn't take his phone since that was too risky. Maybe he could take his computer, not too risky, as well. While he was thinking about it he tossed his phone onto his bed. Oh yeah he could take some bedding. As he just grabbed a small pillow and removed its case he stuffed that and a small blanket into the backpack. Then he went to his bathroom and put the only non-hero toothbrush he had, a tube of toothpaste and soap and shampoo into a Ziploc bag and put them into the backpack. I gotta eat. Izuku said as he walked to the pantry and grabbed everything small that his mother wouldn't likely notice that it was non-perishable. In the end he ended up with a few bags of chips, granola bars, and four bottles of water. Hopefully I can make this last a while. Izuku said, glancing at the man who had been home for about two hours now and was expecting his mother back any minute. As Izuku put everything into his bag he returned to his computer with a pen and blank notebook. With the small knowledge of science he had from school and the information from the websites he compiled a list of chemicals and supplies he would need for what he wanted to do. But stuff like that costs money and said money was just a few deals away in the future. Only one last thing to do. Izuku said, as he tore the back page of his notebook out. Dear mom, I am staying over at a friend's house tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Take care. Izuku. Izuku wrote and put the note on the kitchen table. After that he went to his computer and deleted everything on it. After all, you can't leave too many traces. Grabbing his bags he made sure he left no other traces he was leaving. Wish I could say I would miss this life, but no. Izuku said, as he rushed out the front door. It was already dark out, but he knew the general area he would be heading towards. And so begins my life. As the scarecrow. Boom. A small explosion went off in Izuku's face, covering it in soot. Frag. Izuku said, wiping the grime off of his face. It's been about five weeks since he ran away and began his new life. And he found it surprisingly easy. Sure he had to worry about the police and heroes looking for him, but they were easy to avoid. He even found an old building that was abandoned in a less populated part of town. New house for him though. And then his money. Turns out he owned a bunch of collector's edition all night action figures that got him about 300 United States dollars each. So 12 of them have him plenty of spending cash. The only real difficulty was getting the supplies he needed. He actually spent his first two weeks looking for a salesman to buy from. Experiment number 24, compound A35 to 765 test failure. Izuku said to himself, as he wrote down some information in a notebook next to a chemical formula, now marked failure. As Izuku finished writing this down, he grabbed the damaged beam still containing a combination of chemicals and threw them in a waste barrel. Turns out if you know the right people and have a big enough wallet you can buy pretty much anything. So that's how Izuku ended up with a bunch of chemical storage containers, the chemicals themselves, and all the scientific equipment he currently needed. He also bought himself an untraceable laptop and phone for another $1,000. Bringing his grand bill up to $2,400. Over half of his money, but worth it. Another failed test. Izuku groaned to himself as he slumped down into a rolling office chair. 24 tests, and not one of them worked. Izuku didn't know what he was doing wrong. Sure the first few attempts he was still learning on how to do this stuff, but now he understood it. Or at least thought he did. Kicking his chair rolling over to a desk where his laptop was set up, he went back to one of his most visited tabs. It was a chemical formula tab with information on the various known chemicals and substances manufactured and found in the world. What am I doing wrong? Izuku pondered looking between his most recent formula and the information on the website. Let's see he used the proper components. He heated them up. His math should be correct. What did he do wrong? You know he knew trying to become a chemist online was going to be hard but he didn't think it would be this hard. Suddenly an idea dawned on him. Pulling out his phone he hit his one and only contact. His salesman. The phone didn't even ring before it got answered. Ah Mr. Crow how very nice to hear from you. Enjoying the merchandise. The person on the other end said giddy, using the alias Izuku was now going by. I was actually going to talk to you about that. Izuku said. I see. Well, as you know my policy. The man said, smirking on the other side. Yes I am aware. Izuku air before putting a counter offer out. 
But what if I said I have a deal for you? I would say I'm listening. The man said. Well, as you know I'm currently working on a special formula to correct. Izuku said not wanting to screw this up. Yes. Though that's all you told me. The man said, already thinking about where this was going. Well I'm currently having some difficulty with that. So here's your offer. Izuku said, pausing. If you can get an assistant skilled in chemistry to aid me for the time being, I'm prepared to offer you the selling rights to my compound. So I supply you with aid, and in exchange K sells your product. The man asked, making sure he got the full understanding. Anything else? Izuku smiled at this knowing the deal was already made. Well this aid will need to be disposable. And I might need a few other additions to my lab. And those would be. Just a restraining table and chair and a lot of soundproof glass. Izuku said. Now we talk about money. The man said, smirking. About that. Izuku said I'm willing to offer you a 60% cut of all sales made. And of course I'm willing to pay 500 right now, as a show of good faith. A little advice, work on your bargaining skills. The man said. But I do, however, agree to this deal. I'll send the aid with the other stuff to your place. With only what he needs to know. And I also feel like I shouldn't need to tell you what happens if this doesn't work out. The man said. Oh it should be provided your advertising is good. Izuku jokes. Expect everything in two days goodbye. The man said, as the call cut off. Upon hearing this Izuku was ecstatic. Not on why would he be getting professional hell, but also his first diversified and human test subject. Pocketing his phone, Izuku turned to a blank page in his notebook and began writing out a new formula glancing back and forth between his laptop and his writing. He had two days to wait for his stuff, but he wasn't going to do anything. He can still learn on his own. Two days and six more failed attempts later. Izuku stopped what he was doing when he heard a knock at his door. And it just so happened to be the knock his salesman used when dropping stuff off. Hello. Izuku said, opening the door. Standing there was a man, maybe in his early to mid-thirties. He was wearing a lab coat and white pants. Behind him were several large packages, which Izuku guessed was his other stuff. Mr. Crow? The guy asked, looking down on Izuku. Yes. Now bring everything inside. Izuku said before disappearing. After that all of the boxes were moved in, and everything was set up. And then the two were at work. Izuku learned all sorts of things he was doing wrong that websites wouldn't tell you. Soon he had another compound to test. And then three more in just a few hours of work. Izuku had to admit that his assistant was a worthwhile investment. But everything's usefulness comes to an end, and his assistant has already done what was needed of him. Now for the last thing Izuku wanted him for. I never thought I'd be working for a kid. His assistant admitted. Looks can always be deceiving. Izuku said quietly. Well if you don't mind my asking, what's a kid doing trying to create a chemical weapon that affects the brain? He asked while not facing Izuku. This. Izuku said, covering the guy's mouth in a chloroform rag, knocking him out. What else would I do since I'm finished with you? Izuku said, as he began dragging the body over to the restraining table. Eventually after 30 minutes Izuku was able to lift the guy onto the table and tighten the restraints. Then he grabbed a spray can and poured every compound they made together into it and then shook it. You see, chloroform was the first thing I learned to test it on myself. Izuku said, talking to the unconscious body, recalling all the times he was knocked out for hours. But now you get the honor of being my first test subject. Izuku said, walking over to the body. Then standing, as far back, as he could be sprayed the can for a good 5 seconds. Then Izuku put the large panels of soundproof glass into place, completely sealing the other guy off. Then he started to wake. What happened? He asked, trying to run his head, finding he could not. Izuku stayed quiet as he watched the man's eyes widen as he started squirming in the restraints. No they're all over me get off. The man screamed as he tried to break free. It appears he has quite the lung capacity. Izuku said, writing down his observations in a notebook. He stayed quiet observing the man for the next five minutes until he went quiet. Hello. Are you alive there? Izuku asked as he knocked on the glass. The man didn't respond and his body was limp in the restraints. Ed. Izuku told himself while removing a panel of the glass. I'm sure you screamed your heart out. Izuku said as he removed the restraints noting the fact that he couldn't hear anything. Yep, he's dead. Izuku told himself as he felt a heartbeat. Now to get rid of you. As Izuku dragged the man off the table and through his building, he ended up just leaving his corpse in the back area of his lair. That being a back alley network. Enjoy your stay and your assistance was greatly appreciated. Izuku joked before looking at the lab coat the man wore. Nice jacket. Izuku said before taking it off of the man's corpse and trying it on. 
that was a little bit on him being more like a trench coat than a lab one. But nothing a good growth spurt wouldn't fix. As Izuku then took everything the man had in his pockets out. That being a knife, 200 United States dollars, and a gun. Looks like I picked the right man. Izuku said, as he cocked the gun, seeing as it had a full magazine. For the next month Izuku began to manufacture large amounts of his fear toxin, and improved it on the way. His contact had also kept his end of the bargain, and was selling it, and splitting the profit. Izuku was surprised at how many people were buying it. What's more is that he was raking in quite the profit. Soon the name Scarecrow was a well-known one in the underworld. The currently faceless man of nightmares. But soon Izuku would make his face known. And soon Scarecrow would show himself. And now, if only he could get the rats to keep out of his food, they would start to freak him out. The Scarecrow. Now that was a name everyone knew. From low-level thugs to the top heroes they knew it. And it was all due to his fear of toxins. A very powerful hallucinogenic has been responsible for hundreds of deaths. All by suicide. But the thing was nobody ever saw Scarecrow. All deals were conducted at night and by a hired man who ended up dead or missing after the deal. And that was because Izuku wanted to make a grand entrance. But he had to have the proper attire. And so the Scarecrow outfit was born. It was nothing special really. It was basically a bunch of fabric with patches sewn on here and there. But it had a light layer of thin body armor underneath. It had gloves and he had a hood-like shawl piece with it. But the mask was the best part. It covered his whole head, he had to cut his hair shorter so he didn't sweat a crap ton in it. It had a voice modifier that made his voice deeper and raspy with an air filtration system in it that acted as a gas mask. It also covered his eyes making them appear solid orange yellow. Naturally it had a few surprises in it. Izuku's contact had gotten him some advanced support gear that seamlessly fit in his outfit. In the sleeves there were toxin sprayers that with just a slight motion of his hand would emit a stream of his fear toxin from a canister hidden on his back underneath his outfit. He had a belt that stores small pellets full of his toxin and a gun in it, just in case. But the real beauty was his side. Since Izuku was going for a scarecrow motif, keeping with the theme he had a side made for him. It was a basic side, but with a titanium blade and reinforced wood staff. It wasn't like he couldn't afford it with the millions he was making in the underworld. Which brought him to his current predicament. He had recently sold a newer batch of his toxin to a group called the Yakuza. Apparently people don't like it when they buy a toxin that makes people hallucinate and they end up screaming to death. So they demanded an audience with the scarecrow. So a few hired guns and one armored van later, Izuku found himself in a parking complex at night with nobody there but him and the Yakuza. Or they thought. Pair to explain this. A thug said, tossing the still squirming body of a fellow member who was bound and gagged. Izuku just smirked as he was hidden in the van where he couldn't be seen. These people really had no idea what they were messing with. You're gonna answer or stay quiet. Another one yelled. Izuku decided to play this scene up for his dramatic reveal. Plus why not spook them a little bit. I said my compound would take you places. Izuku said as he walked out of the van holding his scythe and his outfit with his voice distorted. His appearance made a few of the Yakuza thugs step back. I never said they'd be places you wanted to go. Izuku said in a coy manner. Even still you killed three of our men and put this one here in this state. The first Yakuza said, pointing at the squirming body. That sounds more like a problem doesn't it? Izuku said not the least bit intimidated. It's about to be your problem. One of the thugs said and was met by the sound of cocking guns pointed at him from Izuku's men. You know if you're gonna threaten someone at least make sure the guns aren't pointed at you. Izuku said, chuckling, as he watched the Yakuza step back. So why even if you kill us we have an army? One said. And I have four semi-automatic guns and a pistol trained on you. Izuku said, grabbing his gun and pointing at them. But now what would the fun be in simply killing you? Izuku said before putting a bullet in the skull of the Yakuza who was tied up. Bastard. One of them screamed. Says the man scared to death. Izuku joked before returning the gun and grabbing a few of his gas pellets. If you want to fight then bring it. Another Yakuza said activating his quirk turning to a stone golem. No, I don't want to fight. Izuku said before signaling for his men to lower their guns. I want to hear you scream. As Izuku yelled this he threw the gas pellets in his hand at the group of Yakuza covering them in his gas. Fool. Why do you think we were gas masks? One yelled before he started hacking. Because you haven't experienced compound Z46SK5 yet. Izuku said before the sounds of the Yakuza men screaming echoed through the area. Penetrates gas masks and works 50% better than all of my other compounds. As Izuku stood there he just listened to their screams. Truly they were music to his ears. Heading others about in fear as he once had was quite exhilarating for him. It truly was music to his ears. 
But even music tends to get too loud at points, and Izuku knew he would have to cut this short. Fill them, and raid their truck. Izuku commanded his men, as two of them went to the vehicle the Yakuza came in, and the other two shot them in the heads. However, just as Izuku turned to get back in his van, one of his men called to him. Boss. You might want to see this. He called, as he opened the back of their vehicle. This better be worth it. Izuku said, as he walked to the vehicle, cutting a few throats on the way. After witnessing people commit suicide a bunch of times death really didn't frighten him, as much, as he thought it would. In fact he enjoyed killing. But not to excess, no he preferred to see the terror in their eyes when they realized their fate. So what is it that I need to see Izuku started, but went quiet at what he saw. Well now. In the back of the Yakuza's truck there was a girl. About six years if Izuku had to guess, and unconscious. But what he saw on her unnerved him. Bandages, and he means bandages all over her arms and legs. Yes he was a villain who shipped out crates full of a toxin that resulted in 19% of all suicides in Japan, but never to a child. Much less a young one like this. Still what to do with her. He had already killed the Yakuza thugs who met with him, probably sparking a war. So what harm would taking the girl do? Your orders sir? His man asked, as Izuku contemplated. Bring her with us. Izuku said before storming back to the van. Yes sir. He replied before grabbing the girl and carrying the girl with him back to the van. That's what Izuku liked about these hired guns. They didn't speak unless spoken to and only asked the necessary questions. And did what they were told. Alright load up. Izuku yelled to the other man as he hopped into the back of the van. That was until he heard a muffled cry and noticed one of his men gone. So the infamous scarecrow decides to show himself. A man said in the darkness. Izuku silently cursed at this. He already knew who it was, he had been tracking him for the last month. And Izuku picked this day to be sloppy. Erase your head. Izuku said, stepping down from the van, as his other two men who weren't holding the girl trained their guns on him. Don't forget about me. A female voice suddenly called pink covered the area, and the rest of Izuku's thugs dropped unconscious. Damn it. It had to be midnight. Izuku cursed, as both figures stepped out of the shadows. Strange. Do normal people drop when I use my quirk? Midnight said, surprised, Izuku was still standing. The gas mask. Erase your head said in a deadpan voice. Slag. I can't take them both on, and I don't have any gas pellets left. And based on Erasure Head's record, what little I could find of him he's going to prove difficult. Izuku thought in his head before glancing back at the girl. Strange as it was, he felt an obligation to her, and they hadn't even spoken or really seen each other yet. No matter, that would all be pointless if he was caught and imprisoned. Well that plan might work, but it would be a long shot. Now for hopefully the best acting job of his life. So taking on the proverbial, self-proclaimed master of fear doesn't frighten you? Izuku asked in a more soft tone of voice, which was only made creepier by the voice modifier. Not really. I'm more surprised that the big bad scarecrow is a kid. Erase your head said, activating his quirk. Wait till he gets a kick out of this. Izuku thought internally, chuckling that Erase your head was erasing a quirkless person's quirk. Ever heard of don't judge a book by its cover? Izuku said before tugging his hood further over his mask. Every day. Erase your head said getting in a battle stance followed by midnight doing the same. Now for the long shot. Izuku thought quickly calculating what he would need to do in order for this plan to work. Let's see I'm out of gas pellets so they're out of the question. I do have the hidden gas sprayers, but they were for close quarters, and I doubt I could last in a fight like that against them. I do have my gun, but they could easily dodge. But there are the gas canisters in the back of the van. And since they were pressurized Izuku was cut off by a racer head running towards him. You know a little working would be nice Shouta. Midnight said before running, as well. Screw it. Izuku mentally proclaimed, as if luck was on his side, he evaded Erasure Head's attack. When he evaded he took the chance to swipe his scythe at him, but instead felt something pull it from his hands, seeing Midnight's whip pulling towards her midair. Surprise hun. Midnight said, snatching the scythe and winding her whip. Now are you gonna give up or do this the hard way? Which way do you think numbskull? Izuku thought, as he tended to grab his gun. Staying awfully quiet over there. Midnight said, as she walked next to Erasure Head holding the scythe. Why should I talk in the middle of quality entertainment? Izuku laughed before pulling his gun and sending a bullet past the two heroes into his van. You're quite the shot. Midnight joked about missing Erasure Head going wide-eyed from the hissing sound. Shit. He cursed as he grabbed Midnight and pushed her out of the way taking the full blast of the explosion. But I mentioned compound Z46 SK5 was also flammable. Izuku jokes, as he picks up his side that was thrown towards him in the blast. You bastard. Midnight screamed, as she started to charge at him, but stopped. 
You know you might save him if you get to a hospital quickly. Izuku said, picking up the still unconscious body of the girl. Damn you. Midnight yelled before turning to help free erase her head from the rubble and fire. When she looked back the scarecrow was gone, no sign that he had been there except for a little doll that looked like a cute scarecrow. His calling card. After that ordeal erase her head suffered severe two-degree burns and was put on ice for three months to heal. Much of the hero society was shaken after that when rumors that the scarecrow nearly killed Erasure Head started circulating. The thugs that were captured knew nothing and were just simple paid goons. All evidence burned in the explosion and the girl scarecrow took was never seen again. Meanwhile Izuku was laying low. His activity was at zero. No shipments, no deals, nothing but him, his lab and his daughter. Wait daughter. A few months later. Izuku was currently asleep in his apartment on his bed. He had stayed up all night working in his lab, he immediately crashed out when he hit his bed. He didn't care how long he slept, as long as he got a few hours. Or he was hoping until he woke up to the sound of freaking boards in his room. You know if you want to scare me, please do it quietly. I, you taunted knowing who was there without opening his eyes. No fair. The girl whined hopping into Izuku's bed. Yep, this was his daughter. The master of fear who was well known now as a villain had the single-handedly most adorable daughter who added another 1% to his suicide rates. She was the girl he had taken in his first and currently only outing as a villain. Her name was Eerie. Apparently the Yakuza were using her for something but what she didn't know. And honestly Izuku didn't care or want to know. It had taken precisely 1 million United States dollars, 3 free shipments of his toxin, and a promise to not kill any more Yakuza unnecessarily to the boss overhaul to keep the girl, and for him to not be under the kill on sight list they had. Best decision he ever made in his opinion. He actually found it relaxing in a way. Plus she didn't cry, an unexpected bonus. The worst she did was ask to sleep with him at night due to nightmares. But there was much worse a child her age could do. It did take her about three, seems to accept Ayu, and the fact that she wasn't going back to the Yakuza. And she was happy about it. Here she actually felt genuine love and care. Plus he gave her a cool costume like he has, because why not? It didn't really surprise her that she was living with another super villain. In her opinion he was way better than Overhaul. He didn't hurt her, fear her apart, and put her back together, or harvest her blood for stuff. No, Izuku actually acted like a father to her. Plus he gave her cool stuff. She also got her own room. Which was pretty bare bearing the bed, clothes, and the few toys she got. He sometimes even let her help him in the lab. Granted it was usually watching and handing him empty beakers or tools, because who trusts a six-year-old with dangerous chemicals? Not a bright move and one Izuku wasn't going to make. What time is it? Izuku groaned as he sat up, opening his eyes. 1.30. Sri said, sitting on Izuku's bed. Am or PM? Izuku asked, still tired. PM? You slept for 13 hours. Iri said, as she nudged closer to Izuku. That long. Izuku complained, as he slid out of bed. What do you want for lunch then? Nothing. I already ate. Iri said hopping down for Izuku's bed following him to their makeshift kitchen. Okay then. I guess all these apples are gonna go bad then. Izuku jokes, as Iri started squirming to get over him. No fair daddy. Iri said, trying to reach past him. Okay here you go. Izuku surrendered, giving Iri two apples. Thanks. Iri said before she started eating. Yep. This was pretty much normal for the two. Iri acts adorable, and Izuku taunts her. Like right now, as he watched Iri devour the apples, getting pieces of the skin around her mouth. You know, sometimes I wonder if I rescued a vacuum cleaner with as much as you eat. Izuku joked which was followed by a protest from Iri, saying this was coming from the man who eats three bowls of katsudan for dinner every other night. Okay you got me. Izuku said, as Yuri was putting her cheek staring at him. So anyway what's on the schedule that I haven't missed? Izuku asked, chugging a cup of coffee. So now you want to know. Yuri said, as she pulled out a folder. Yes, my greatest assistant and daughter who scares me when she gets angry. Izuku jokes, as Yuri chuckled. Okay. Well first thing at 3 you have a new shipment of supplies being delivered for the lab, Yuri said, as Izuku nodded. Then at 5 there's the usual pay off of a shipment with a hired goon, Izuku sighed at that. And then at 6. 30 you have a meeting with the League of Villains. Oh right. He forgot about that. Apparently this League wanted his assistance in something, what he didn't know. All he really cared about was that they were paying him a lot of money. And it was money he really could use. Oh right you know what to do right? Izuku asked, making sure Iri knew what she was supposed to do during the day. Don't mess with the lab, stay clear of your clients, and make sure I have my costume on. Iri said, as Izuku ruffled her hair. Yep. Now go play in your room while I get to work. 
Izuku said, as Yuri gave him a quick hug, and ran off. God bless that girl. Izuku said, as he started walking into his lab. Ever since the night he got Yuri he had upgraded his lab substantially. Food one thing it now had reinforced walls, a metal code locked door, and a sprinkler system. And thus he was now pretty much broke. Sure he had enough supplies to get back the money. That would be if the trigger drug had not been imposed on his turf. And if the bloody heroes weren't watching for any sign of him. All safe to say his business was pretty slim. That was until he had gotten a message from a group called the League of Villains. They only gave him a meeting place, and a promise that if he agreed to do something for him, well one million dollars would make anyone agree. Then there was a your head however. Turns out giving someone two degree burns, and capitalizing them for three months loses them off. As Izuku walked into his lap he input his security code to open the door. They. He put on his lab clothes. Which was basically slipping off his jacket if he had one, and putting on the lab coat his first assistant wore. Sure he made some aesthetic changes to it, like asking a series of large exaggerated stitch patterns to go with his theme, as a villain. Then he also added an insulating layer to it for when he was working with a lot of heat or cold. Let's see here. Compound BX3 to 861, GY2 to 978, Izuku muttered to himself, as he traced his finger over the various vials of his compounds in his containment unit. Every vial was one of his previous compounds. Some were versions of his fear toxin toxin, others were steroids he had tried to make, and a few were even actual poisons. But one of them in particular was the one he was looking for. Here we go. Izuku said cheerfully, grabbing the vial, and the notebook dedicated to it specifically. Compound QKS 693. Taking the two items he walked over to his lab table, and put the vial in his chemical mixer. Opening the notebook he turned to page 50. Each page before that were detailed steps to creating the compound, and the chemical formula for every component of the compound. And it just so happens that Izuku isn't even halfway done with this yet. Fortunately for him the tools that made trigger left samples of it everywhere, making it easy for Izuku to acquire its formula for his own uses. Alright so when the compound is injected it heads towards the brain. There it stimulates the optical and central nervous systems. However when it comes into contact with a pheromone the brain secretes it breaks down. Creating a shield for it is difficult. But if we're to Izuku got lost in his constant rambling he lost track of time as he switched between writing in the notebook and grabbing various other chemicals and items to add to his compound. She didn't stop until he heard a knock on his lab door. Yes Yuri. Izuku called loudly enough to be heard across the door. It's 5. 30. Yuri called back before walking away. That late already huh? Hopefully he came through Thormi on the delivery and paid off as usual. Izuku said surprised he lost four hours of his life in what felt like a few minutes. As Izuku finished writing in his notebook he closed it. Then he took the vial out of the mixer and put both it and the notebook back into his containment unit. Then he took off his lab coat and hung it back onto his coat rack. Exiting his lab he made sure that the door was sealed before going to his room. Once there he donned his scarecrow outfit and sighed. Never can be too careful especially with other villains. Walking out of his room he was eerie had already put on her outfit. It was nothing really, just a pair of orange foodie pajamas with a large burlap mask with button eyes and a stitched on smile. Also, as an added bonus all of Eerie's hair could fit in the mask, and strangely she stayed cool. Izuku was still looking into that. Okay Eerie remember don't draw attention. Izuku said, as Eerie nodded. Now why not just leave her at the base? Because A he doesn't trust the Yakuza to stay away when he's gone. B on the off chance a hero like Erasure Head gets lucky and finds the base he doesn't want her there for it and see she didn't like it when they were far apart. So that's how they both ended up in an old looking well kept bar for the meeting. I must say it's a pleasure to have the great scarecrow in our little hideout. The leader of the league Tamura Shigaraki, said sitting on a bar stool facing Izuku and Iri in their outfits. That to the point. Izuku said wanting to know why they wanted him. All in due time. Care for a drink? Shigaraki asked, as the other member, a man named Kurajiri who was made out of most in a bartender suit, was behind the bar cleaning glasses. I make it a habit to not drink anything I don't open or prepare. Izuku said knowing full well how easy it is to poison people. Come on it's not like we would invite you here just to poison you. Shigaraki said defensively. Just tell me why you wanted to meet me. Izuku said, as he felt Yuri grab his leg. You're no fun, Shigaraki said before sliding a file over to Izuku. As Izuku picked it up to read it, he found it was a schedule for a training exercise in the US, led by All Might, 13, and Erasure Head. Doesn't answer my question. Izuku said annoyed. Don't you get it, Shigaraki said gleefully. We know that All Might is going to be teaching a group of wannab heroes away from the main campus. Making it the perfect opportunity to kill him. 
Now that surprised Izuku. Killing All Might, the number one hero. It was literally one of those tasks that was easier said than done. But on the other hand if they could do it it would send society into chaos. And how do you intend to kill him? Izuku asked to return the folder. As soon as he said that, a massive beast entered the room. It easily matched All Might in terms of height and buffness. Even Izuku had to agree that the brain on its head was rather grotesque. But if this thing could kill All Might then then, well he wanted to be there when it happened. Do you like Nomu? Shigaraki asked, as Izuku nodded. It's a rather interesting individual. Izuku said, as the thing just stood there not moving. It's completely quiet and obedient. Shigaraki said, scratching at his neck. So why do you need me? Izuku asked, wondering why they needed him if they had this thing. Well we don't exactly expect the kids, and other two pro heroes, to let All Might die, so we have amazed a small army to stop them. Shigaraki explained. And you want me to join? Izuku said, putting the pieces together. More or less. Shigaraki said. Izuku put some thought into his answer. But he already knew what he was going to say. I will partake in this event of yours, Izuku started, as Shigaraki smiled. But I won't join your group. Why the hell not? Shigaraki yelled. I prefer to work alone or with only one other person who stays quiet. Izuku said. Shigaraki was furious. So furious in fact he disintegrated the glass he was drinking out of. He might have done the same to Scarecrow had Kurajiri not calmed him. Fine. Do what you want. We attack in one week. Shigaraki yelled before leaving the room. And that was Izuku's first meeting with the League of Villains. Needless to say it went okay, or, as okay, as one can get when meeting with a man who wants to kill All Might. And so that's how Izuku found himself standing in front of a vortex of purple mist that he had been told was a warping quirk that belonged to Kurajiri. Izuku smiled, as he made sure he had everything. Holding his scythe he walked through the portal and into the area that held an unexpected surprise for him. The moment Izuku stepped out of the mist he was surprised at the sheer size of the building they were in. If there was one thing he could credit Yue for it was that they went all out when they needed to. But that wasn't why he was here. Shigaraki just said make sure the kids and other two heroes don't interfere with All Might's death. He could deal with that. Plus why not watch a few young heroes to be scream their hearts out. This should be fun. Izuku grinned as he sat on top of his vantage point in a large rocky area. Shigaraki and Nomu were in the center of the complex, while the rest of the villains were spread throughout the facility. So that's what the crow looks like. Izuku heard one of the goons below him say. He's a bloody kid. Bet you he could be a student. He heard another one say. I bet you he isn't even the real deal. Another said. Okay now they were getting on his nerves. But still it's not logical to kill your own men or comrades in his case. Hey did you hear he kidnapped a girl a few months ago? Heard she was a brat. Yes that's why the Yakuza let him keep her. Okay now they're going to die. I advise against speaking ill of my daughter. Izuku growled standing up on the high rock peak he was on. Or what shrimp? One of them said. You die. Izuku said plainly. When he said that a few of the thugs laughed while some backed away feeling the killing intent from him. What are you gonna reap our souls with your scythe? A villain mocked. No, Izuku said, as the villains looked at him with confusion. I'm going to listen to you scream. As Izuku said this he threw a cluster of his gas pellets at the thugs who were insulting him. So while well they scream their hearts out, let's review their mistakes. Mistake number one, making fun of Izuku. Mistake number two, believing he was weak and could easily be defeated. Mistake number three, and this is the biggest mistake, they insulted Eerie. You do not insult Eerie in Izuku's presence and live. So, as the thugs quickly died Izuku jumped down from his vantage point. Anyone else wished to insult me or my daughter? Izuku asked and was met with a chorus of no's and shaking heads. Good. The entirety of the USJ was filled with screams coming from the mountain zone. This alone set the students and teachers on edge. Which would be fine if they weren't currently being attacked by villains. And then they stopped. What the hell? Kaminari Denki yelled as he along with the rest of his class ran to the exit of the USJ. Whose screaming was that? Tokoyami Fumikage said. Who cares, just run. Mina Shido yelled. All the students were present and me and Azawa are the only teachers Pro Hero 13 thought. Azawa mentioned his encounter with the Scarecrow, no. The 413 could worry about that the warping quirk mist man blocked their path. I do apologize for our intrusion, but we had to invite ourselves in, Kurajiri said. But I must ask where All Might is. We were under the impression he was supposed to be here, Kurajiri continued. No matter, I'm sure disposing of you will draw him out. Shut up and die. Bakugo said, as he and Kirishima charged at him, knocking him down and creating a large dust cloud. Did you really think we would just stand by while you monologue? Kirishima said, wiping his mouth. No. 
I didn't. Kurajiri said, as the smoke cleared. Truly you are the golden eggs of society, Kurajiri started. But let's see how well you can handle my associates. Kurajiri said that he enveloped the entire class in his work, in an attempt to disperse them across the USJ. When his quirk cleared he saw he missed six students, and thirteen. Oh well, hopefully the others could take care of the students he sent them. Bam we're surrounded. Jiro Kayoka said, as she, Momo Yeoi Rozu and Kaminari were in the mountain zone surrounded by thugs. These guys should be no big deal right? Kaminari said, as he used his quirk to create electricity around his arms. Let us hope. Yeoi Rozu said using her quirk to create a fighting staff and sword. Thanks. Jiro said, taking the sword. As the three fought off the thugs that charged at them they were getting overwhelmed slightly. There's too many of them. Kaminari said exhausted. Then let's hope the others will help. Yeoi Rozu said. Just then all the thugs backed up as slow clapping was heard. I must say it's impressive that you've lasted this long. A person said, as the villains made room for him to walk through. Another one. Jiro said, huffing for breath. Oh come now surely you're not giving up that easily. He said stopping. You got that right. Kaminari said, charging his quirk. Just as he did that a large sheet came out from Yeoi Rozu's back covering her and Jiro. Now. She called, as Kaminari unleashed a large barrage of electricity from his body. Unknown to them Izuku dropped a gas pellet enveloping him in a grayish gas different to the green of his fear toxin. Did we get them? Yeoi Rozu asked, as she and Jiro got out from under the sheet. Let's hope so. Jiro said, as she saw Kaminari acting like he did when he overused his quirk. Just then the gas around Izuku cleared, showing him unharmed among the others unconscious. Try again. Izuku said drawing his side. Shit. Jiro yelled, as Izuku started walking toward them. Now then which one to take, which one? Izuku muttered to himself just loud enough for the two to hear. As the doors to the USJ blew open, All Might stepped through the dust cloud. However his trademark smile was replaced with a frown, and his body was teeming with anger. As the students looked at him with joy he spoke. It fills my soul with pride to know that my students fought with all their might, he began. But now I can safely say that you can have no fear for I am here. As he said this he flew through the main area of the USJ, as he knocked out every villain he saw, and rescued Erasure Head who was beaten bloody, and battered from the Nomu, and Asui, and Mineta who had barely survived the villains from the flood zone. Take Azawa, and get out of here. All Might ordered the two, as they nodded, and ran to the others at the doors. Shigaraki however was shaking with excitement. He's here. He's finally here. Shigaraki said, as he turned to Nomu. Nomu, Shigaraki said, as the beast turned its head to look at him. Kill him. As Shigaraki said this the Nomu charged at All Might, as the two got locked in a flurry of punches. It's impressive that you can take a punch from me, and stand. All Might said surprised that his punches were having little to no effect. That's from his quirk, shock absorption. Shigaraki gloated. I think I'll take you. Izuku said, pointing his scythe at Jiro. Like hell you will. She said furiously getting in a battle stance. As soon as she did this Izuku started laughing. You really have no idea who I am. He taunted. Another villain who's about to get beat. Jiro said glaring at him. No, wrong answer. I'm the guy that put Erasure Head over there in the hospital for three months. Izuku said, as did Jiro's, and Yeoi Rozu's eyes went wide. Azawa had told them of that encounter when someone in their class had asked. He said it was the infamous villain Scarecrow who had done it, and that he was to be avoided. I take it from the expression of fear in your eyes that the gears have started turning. Izuku said, as Jiro regained her composure, and glared at him. Regardless of who you are I'll be damned if I let you take me without a fight. Jiro said, pointing her sword at him. No, I think you are. Izuku said, chuckling. And why would she? Yeoi Rozu said not caring for the fact her breasts were exposed. Because if she doesn't come quietly, Izuku said, walking over to Kaminari who was now on the ground unconscious, and picking him up with one hand by the neck. He dies. Bastard. Jiro yelled. Your choice. I let him go, and take you, or I kill him, and still take you. Izuku taunted holding his scythe's blade dangerously close to Kaminari's throat. So what's your choice? Izuku asked, seeing the rage on Jiro's face. Hiro just growled, as she debated. It was either Kaminari dies, or she willingly submits. Gritting her teeth she made a decision. I. All Might was currently in a tough spot. The Nomu creature was able to take every one of his punches he threw at it. To top it off his students had decided to step in, and thus put themselves in the large crossfire between him and the beast. This thing could even regrow its limbs when they were torn off. Plus its shock absorption quirk was starting to get really annoying. Wait, if its quirk is shock absorption, and not nullification. That just might work. 
As All Might once again charged at the Nomu, Shigaraki began chuckling. Fool. Didn't you listen to me? He has shock absorption. Shigaraki gloated as he watched All Might punch. I heard you for the first time. All Might said as the Nomu began getting pushed back. But if it's absorption and not nullification then there's a limit. Everyone was taken aback as the Nomu started losing ground. The one taken aback the most however was Shigaraki. That bastard. He growled as he watched All Might punch. Every one of his damned hits. Is all he has. And if there's a limit then I will find it. All Might yelled as he blasted Nomu into the air. Tell me, villain, have you heard this before? He continued as he grabbed the Nomu midair and threw it into the ground creating a giant crater. Go beyond All Might began as he charged up his next punch. Plus Ultra. All Might yelled as he blasted Nomu out of the dome of the USJ, shaking the entire complex. Everyone stepped back as All Might stood there victorious. I really have gotten weaker. He might have joked with himself. In my prime a mere 5 hits would have sufficed. But today I have thrown over 200. Shigaraki was teeming with rage as All Might stood there instead of Nomu. It didn't help when All Might turned to him and Kurajiri. Now villains. I'm sure we would all like to end this quickly. All Might said taking a few steps forward. You haven't gotten weaker at all. Shigaraki said in a low voice did he lie to me? Now then if anyone else wants to fight me. All Might said glaring at them come get me. Shigaraki was literally tearing skin off of his neck right now. No, 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 no. I'll still kill you in Nomu's place. Shigaraki yelled as he prepared to rush All Might. Then a voice rang out in the area, followed by the sound of two pairs of footsteps. Come on Shigaraki, you can't always complain about things. The voice said, as the owner walked through the smokescreen created from All Might's fight, revealing that of Izuku holding Jiro by the neck, dragging her with him. What did you just say Scarecrow? Shigaraki growled as he turned to face him. I knew your plan to kill All Might would fail, Izuku continued as he saw All Might's face contorted in rage and fear. So I of course had a backup plan. So you're the Scarecrow who attacked Eraser Head. All Might said, gritting his teeth. Who else dresses up like me and fights Eraser Head? Izuku asked jokingly, as Jiro struggled under his grip. Stop squirming or All Might gets a new coat of blood on him. Izuku threatened quietly, as Jiro compiled her eyes showing pain and fear. Why you? Shigaraki growled upset that Scarecrow had undermined him. I'm Shigaraki, Kurajiri said loud enough for only him to hear. This could prove more beneficial to us. Shigaraki gritted his teeth at that. He didn't need help. He would kill All Might, and that was that. Izuku, seeing Shigaraki's face of anger, started walking over in his direction. Come on Shigaraki, can you not see this is better? Izuku asked, as he was only a few yards from him. Why just kill All Might when you can watch him suffer? Izuku stated as he turned to All Might and put his scythe dangerously close to Jiro's throat. You. All Might wanted to scream many things at the villain. But he found his feet frozen to the ground unable to move. I take it that you realize you're not fast enough to save her. Izuku said, taunting All Might who glared at him furiously. Okay now Shigaraki had to admit he was starting to enjoy this. So All Might hears what's gonna happen, Izuku began. Just by going on a limb I imagine the rest of UA's staff are on their way, Izuku continued. So I'm not going to kill this girl, Izuku proclaimed as he tightened his grip around Jiro's neck. But instead for her to stay alive, you must announce that you failed to save her on every national broadcasting network. Izuku finished. Just what the hell is the purpose of him doing that? Shigaraki asked in a demanding tone. Quite a simple one really, Izuku said. Because if All Might fails to protect even a single student. Then I fail at my job, as a hero. All Might finished knowing where this was going. Don't do it. Jiro called, but was quickly silenced by Izuku tightening his grip. One more outburst, and it lights out. He whispered in her ear. All Might was now seething with the same rate Shigaraki was minutes earlier. He was in a loss-loss situation. If he complied with the Scarecrow's demands then his reputation as a hero would be destroyed. But if he tried to save Kirk right now then she would die. He knew he wasn't that fast and couldn't take any risks. So All Might, Izuku began as Kurajiri opened up a portal behind him. What are you going to do? Let me take her and admit to the world you failed. Or are you going to be a hero and try to save her? All Might just glared at him with every fiber of his being. It will be on air at noon for two days. All Might growled as his response shocked everyone but the villains. Excellent choice. Izuku said before injecting Jiro's neck with a syringe, causing her to struggle momentarily before falling limp. But you said All Might began before Izuku cut him off. I said I wouldn't kill her or incapacitate her. Izuku replied snugly before starting to walk backward. By the way, give Erasure Head my regards. 
Izuku said, as he reached behind his back and pulled out another one of his small scarecrow dolls and dropped it. Gurujiri will send me to my place. Izuku asked, as the mist man nodded. But by all might. Izuku taunted, as he began stepping into the portal. And remember I'll be watching. Just then, as Izuku had crossed into the portal the rest of the pro heroes arrived causing Shigaraki and Kurajiri to retreat. The other villains who weren't killed by Scarecrow were captured and interrogated. Meanwhile All Might was preparing for both the rescue mission of his student and his speech he was to make to ensure her survival. All in all it was one hell of a day that he would never forget. Quit squirming will you? Izuku growled as he was trying to contain a thrashing Jiro in his arms. Burn in hell. Jiro screamed in rage trying to break his grip. Already have vacation plans there for next month. Izuku jokes, chuckling, as he tries to continue to pull Jiro through his lab. Let go bastard. Jiro screamed, as she managed to get an arm free and sock Izuku in the face during him to loosen his grip enough for her to get free. Ow. Izuku groaned in pain, as he quickly regained his composure and ran after the folding girl. Don't know what this is, but just be important. Jiro said, as she grabbed a random beaker off of one of Izuku's lab tables and prepared to throw it at him. Izuku stopped when he noticed she was going to throw the beaker at him. Come now even if you manage to escape me you have no idea where you are. Izuku said, pointing out the flaws in Jiro's escape attempt. I don't care where I am, as long as it's away from you. Jiro said before throwing the beam at Izuku, shattering on impact. Despite Izuku's best efforts he accidentally breathed in the fumes, his masks of filters not yet made to handle this new breed, not his toxin. As Izuku began to cough, as the toxin's effects started to kick in, Kirk made a break for the only door she saw. Come on open. She yelled in a vain attempt to pull open the door before spotting the keypad. Stay away. Izuku screamed, catching Jiro off guard. Currently Izuku was tearing at the edges of his mask and hyperventilating. Even through his mask Jiro could see the bloodshot red in his eyes. In fact she almost forgot where she was for a second. That was until she started trying to open the door again. No get back. Izuku said, backing away from a non-existent presence. Must get the antidote. Izuku said before stumbling around the lab and grabbing a syringe filled with a purple liquid marked FTAV 678. As his shaking hands were about to inject himself with it, he found himself being racked by Jiro. Like I'm gonna let you take an antidote. She screamed before getting locked in a tug of war with a vial. Let go. Izuku screamed still under his fear toxin effects. As he and Jiro struggled for a solid 10 seconds he suddenly felt an adrenaline boost and knocked her down, causing her to let go. He quickly injected himself, but only a portion of the antidote was injected before Jiro tackled him again causing the vial to call and break. Damn. Izuku said before grabbing Jiro and putting her in a chokehold. Let me go. Jiro said thrashing again. Not yet. Izuku said, quickly recovering from his small bout with his toxin before grabbing another syringe off of the table. Now this should only hurt for a moment. Izuku said, as he injected the syringe into Jiro's neck. Instantly her body went limp again like the small dose used on her at the USJ. Only this time she was still conscious. Which meant she would see, hear, and know everything being done to her. As Izuku carried her or more appropriately dragged her feet and part of her legs in the ground he began locking her in his usual chair, he strapped his test victims in. There we go nice and tight, Izuku said in a soft voice which sounded scary af with his modifier on. I wouldn't want my little sheep to run away now would I? No, I wouldn't. Jiro wanted to scream and lunch him as he tied her down in the chair. Anne was sure the restraints would cause bruising later if and when she got free. But more importantly was the fact that right now not even her vocal cords were responding to her pleas to work. I take it you are trying to curse at me, am I right? Izuku said, looking at her, as her eyes wouldn't even respond to her commands. You know I'm not going to kill you. Izuku said, surprising Jiro. She wanted to ask why, but Izuku already was going to answer that. But before he took off his mask. And what Jiro did shocked her even more. Izuku's face was much paler than it was about a year ago. And his face was riddled with scars scattered over it. Even his eyes had changed from the once rich emerald green to a duller shade. But his face still retained its adorableness with all of that which changed. And Jiro didn't know what was surprising her the most. The fact that she was abducted by a super villain her age, or the fact that he was adorable, as f, and around him attractive. Surprised, am I right? Izuku asked, his voice now sounding sweet like it was laced with honey. Once more Jiro wanted to cry out, but could not. Please understand that I have no intentions of killing you. Izuku said in a genuine manner. Jiro wanted to know exactly what he meant, but Izuku beat her to it. You see, for most of my youth I felt nothing but a constant sense of fear. 
every environment, every week, and every day I felt it, Izuku said, getting a bit angry at telling this story. And then one day about a year ago death tried to claim me, Izuku said, starting to sound cheery. In a cultist religion, soft of way. And I embraced it. I welcomed it. The thought of dying and it all being over was all I could think. Izuku continued before switching to a grumpy depressed Tonatan. But then no All Might had to come and save me. He ruined my chance at ending this life now I was reading it too. Izuku said, swiping his hand across one of his tables, causing the few vials on it to call to the floor and break. So I decided I would put as many people through the hell I went through every day. Izuku said cackling. And now you coke into the picture. Said turning to Jiro. Okay now she was scared. Even more so that it was from a kidder age. Now that I have you, All Might is about to experience his own hell. All Might was lost. He was broken and battered. No not physically, but I'm his mind and spirit. He had failed to save one of his students. He had failed to be there. He had failed to even try. And that was what killed him. He didn't care even if it was all for one slowly killing him little by little. Right now that seemed like paradise to him. What's more is that in approximately 24 hours he would have to make a public speech on national radio and television networks. So naturally he was a bit nervous and volatile right now. Come on all might it wasn't your fault. Erase your head said sitting down next to the lone number one hero. Except it was. All Might said in a defeated tone. Listen. Erase your head said sternly. We have every registered pro hero, the police, and I'm even sure by now vigilantes working to find that madman. Erase your head said. All while I'm stuck here doing nothing. All Might said. It's what you must do to keep her safe in Tashinori. The principal of Yue Nezu said walking over to the two. Yes. Just leave finding them to us and leave keeping her alive by meeting his terms currently to you. Izuku was humming while he was working on his new project. The compound he had injected Jiro with had worn off after the last hour, so she was back to struggling. Here she was keeping quiet this time, only breaking out with the occasional grunt of frustration. Please don't squirm too much, you'll tear your skin apart. Izuku said without sparing her a glance. Shut up. Jiro said, as she refused to listen. Signing Izuku stopped what he was working on and grabbed another vial from the locker. Before any protest could be given it was injected into Jiro, and she felt her body limp again. Then surprisingly Izuku undid the straps holding her in place leaving her laying there. Stay there a moment please. Izuku said before walking over to his door, inputting his code, and leaving the room. Once more Jiro's body denied her commands for movement. She knew she would have to accept it. She knew it would be a while before anyone found her and rescued her. And right now she was at the mercy of the scarecrow who was seeking to try and keep her alive. She actually found this situation ironic. She would never tell anybody this, but in truth Jiro was fascinated by the scarecrow. Although that might just be her emo dark and brooding side talking. But be mysterious around him and the things he did. Anne even got an account on Erasure's head's experience with him when someone had asked the question before her. If she wasn't kidnapped and being repeatedly sedated, then she might actually find the situation like a dream come true, a fantasy for her. She was in thought when the door opened to the lab again and Scarecrow walked back in. But this time he was followed by a smaller figure in orange foodie looking pajamas and a full head burlap mask without eye holes. As the two walked over to the chair Jiro was in, Scarecrow knelt down and whispered something in the other ear. Then the figure had a nod and then proceeded to touch Jiro's leg and suddenly she felt a pain. It was then that she noticed the blood that was around her ankles and wrists. He was right, she had been cutting herself when trying to break free. But this pain felt like it was closing up. And just like that in a moment the cuts and blood were gone. Before Jiro could marvel at this development Scarecrow spoke to the small E figure. Thank you. You may go. He said in both a commanding yet not commanding tone. The figure nodded and agreed as they walked out of the still open lab door shutting behind them. Now then, Izuku said, as he redid the restraints albeit a little bit looser. Before leaning into Jiro's ear and whispering. Now for phase 2. Izuku was currently mixing up a new compound while Jiro was still strapped to the chair. His muscle relaxing compound was still in effect, so Jiro's body refused anything besides pumping blood and breathing. So, as much as she strained herself to move she couldn't. Even her vocal cords were shot. Would you like to hear a story? Izuku asked as he moved to another part of his lab room. Okay he was still creepy when he talked like that. Oh right, I can't talk, Izuku said. Well I'll just say you do. Hey at least the more he talks the longer Jiro just stays immobile. Right. Allow me to tell you the story of a quirkless boy who became the thing of nightmares, Izuku said, as he began pressing buttons on a vault in his lab wall. 
Ever since the child was born he wanted to be a hero, Izuku started, as he opened the door to reveal a rather normal looking medium sized box. Oh how he admired them. With their bright, shiny capes, powerful, and flashy quirks, and the fact they always came out on top, Izuku said, taking the box and bringing it over to his workstation, Jiro watching him the entire time. He waited and waited until he was four to develop his quirk. His mother was a weak telekinetic, and his father breathed fire, Izuku said, opening the box and pulling out a bulky metal collar. Jiro looked at the collar scared. She could see the needle on the inside of it. And she did not like the look of it. Soon everyone around him developed their quirks. Some got wings, or extendable fingers, or hands of fire, wind manipulation and, Izuku paused, as he stopped what he was doing which caught Jiro off guard. Explosions. Jiro nearly instantly guessed who he was referring to. He's talking about Bakugou. Jiro thought about the two's connection. Izuku then began again with Jiro listening intently. But when the time came for him to develop a quirk he didn't get one. Izuku said with a hint of anger. Everyone saw him as an outcast. They saw him as a waste of space. A worthless pile of trash. Izuku said loudly, slamming his hands on his table. Okay. Now Jiro was more scared if that was even possible. Every day they beat him to a bloody pulp. There wasn't a day that went by where he didn't come home bleeding or with a new bruise. Izuku said, grabbing a large beaker filled with a purple liquid. He felt fear every waking moment of his life. And nobody stopped it. Izuku said, as he grabbed the collar and pressed a button on it and a tube popped out. Izuku then turned to look at Jiro. He could see it in her eyes, the fear she was feeling. And then one day he decided to make them pay. Izuku continued, as he poured the purple liquid into the tube, as rings around the color glowed purple. And thus my dear girl we come here. Izuku said, turning around smiling. As he began to walk towards Jiro she could swear her heart stopped. Soon he was undoing the strap keeping her neck held down. At least Jiro could feel muscle movement in her neck now. As Izuku held her neck up with one hand he used his other hand to press a button retracting the needles on the collar. Now normally this would be the part where the doctor says this won't hurt, Izuku said moving the collar to Jiro's neck, who would have flinched away if she could, instead just looking at it with horror. But if I'm being honest this is going to hurt like hell. Izuku said before clicking the collar around Jiro's neck. Stepping back to make sure the collar was on right and that Jiro was still immobile, Izuku was in the clear. Smiling, as he pulled out a small remote he signed, as he pushed a red button on it. Instantly Jiro felt needles piercing into her throat, as wave after save of pain washed over her. If she could scream she would be putting present Mick to shake with his loud it would be. As the needles pieced deeper into her throat she felt them stab into her vocal CORDS or vocal folds for the science people out there. Please be patient, I know it hurts, Izuku said, seeing the pained expression on Jiro's face, as her muscles were regaining consciousness. Guess I'm right on time. Izuku thought to himself before continuing. This next part I'm afraid will be a lot more painful. After saying that, Izuku pushed the purple button on his remote. As he did this the purple glow around the floor began to face, as the chemical in it was being moved through the needles and coating Joel's vocal cords. Make it stop please make it stop. Jiro somehow screamed at the top of her voice, as it felt like her entire body was on fire. Izuku just smiled, as he pulled up one of his lab chairs to watch this. As Izuku listened to Jiro scream it was like nothing he had heard before. He had heard man woman thug hero and villain alike scream their hearts out in fear. But now the screams the girl in front of him were making from the pain she was feeling. It was quite riveting for him to hear. Please I'll do anything just make it stop. Jiro screamed, her eyes filled with pleading and pain. Izuku just looked at his watch. Only two more hours and it will be over. Izuku said, trying to comfort her. And so Jiro proceeded to scream and beg for two hours straight. Unknown to her every second of this was being recorded with audio and visual. Sure Izuku would have to blur out his face, but he had the camera centered directly over Jiro, so it was not much. Their recording started when Izuku put the collar on her and would end after his serum had taken effect and had time to settle. Eventually Jiro stopped screaming and calmed a little as relief from the constant pain washed over her. Then Izuku started counting down as soon as he noticed her relief. And 3, 2, 1. Izuku counted before Jiro felt pain through her body again. But unlike the burning pain that made her feel on fire this one was cold. It seemed as if her entire body was now frozen on the inside. She even had goosebumps to back it up. Yet the most protest she could offer was heavy breathing, a pained face, ask eyelids, and a sore throat. Now then you should feel cold for the next hour other than that, and mild tiredness. The pain and long part of the procedure is over. Izuku said, getting up. Jiro wanted to say something. Anything would have been fine. Currently even the feeling of talking was foreign to her. 
At least she could feel her muscles responding again. That was a plus. So she was able to move her head slightly until deciding not to with the needles still in her neck. So she just watched as Izuku stood on his chair and grabbed something from the ceiling. The camera. Jiro thought shocked hey fucking recorded this. Before you try to move I would suggest against it. Izuku said, getting down before looking at her. Now then I won't use the anesthetic if you behave. Izuku said, as Jiro tried to move. Now then since I know you're currently freezing I'll have the best turned on just for you. Izuku said, as he grabbed the collar remote and camera heading for the exit door. But before he put his coat and he turned a knob on another console next to the door as no air began filling the room. Luckily all his important and temperature sensitive chemicals were in a temperature regulated locker. To him he was starting to sweat but the goosebumps and slight shivering on Jiro vanished. Now then behave while I go get stuff ready. Izuku said before leaving the room leaving Jiro strapped to the chair with the collar around her neck. At least I'm not cold as hell anymore. Jiro thought as she felt her muscles begin to move again. This moment was about to go down as one of the worst days in All Might's life. Currently he was standing in front of a camera crew that was getting ready to broadcast his speech across every channel and a radio crew doing the same. Five minutes till broadcast. One of the crew members said as All Might nodded. Listen All Might what happened wasn't your fault. Nezu said, raising his paw to comfort All Might. If it weren't for you the other students might not be here at all. Nezu continued. But you were there to save them. Nobody could have predicted the fact that Scarecrow would suddenly reveal himself again, much less to kidnap a student in a campus attack. But I wasn't there in time to save her. All Might said defeat. And now to keep her alive I have to do this. And we are on in 30 seconds. The crew member shouted as Nezu walked away. Are you certain our friend has the uplink ready? Izuku asked in an anonymous voice chat with his contact. Quite certain. As soon as All Might reaches the critical moment of his speech he will take over the airwaves and sound waves. His contact said. And to think one of their own would sell them out just for a little protection. Izuku said, chuckling. Yes, quite funny. He said, however, I'm afraid I must go now. And then the transmission between them was cut off. When was instead replaced by an image of All Might about to do his speech. Grinning, Izuku put on his mask as All Might began. Jiro was still regaining her movement when a screen turned on in front of her. It was All Might and he looked solemn. Attention citizens. All Might said in a voice different than the one he used when heroing. I'm sure many of you know that Yue has recently suffered a recent attack by a group known as the League of Villains. And I am also sure many know that during that attack a student by the name of Jiro, Kaioka was kidnapped by the villain Scarecrow, who we now know works with the League. What? He doesn't work with them. Jiro thought horrified. All Might sighed before continuing. And it is with deepest regrets that I failed to save my student. I both failed my duty not only as a hero but as a teacher. All Might continued. And so it is for this reason I offer my deepest regrets tweets to both the family and friends of my student. Perfect. Izuku all but shouted gleefully. Now let's see how everybody enjoys the show. As Izuku said this he pressed a button on his computer. This activated the uplink program that his contact had placed in the broadcasting equipment. So now he had control of the airwaves. Hello All Might it's been a while. Izuku said with his voice modifier on. Everyone was horrified by what was happening. Some from the appearance of the scarecrow and others from fear of his he gained control of the broadcast. What is this? All Might demanded. Nothing much All Might, just a little friendly chat. Izuku said, shocking everyone on how he hurt All Might. You see I do believe I remember saying don't look for me. Izuku said, causing the entirety of the UA staff to go wide-eyed on the fact he knew of their rescue plan. So in light of your recent failure to comply with my demands, Izuku said smiling. I've arranged for some quality entertainment. Explain yourself villain villain. All Might once again demanded. What do you mean entertainment? Well no All Might aren't we a bit agitated today, Izuku taunted before pressing another button on his keyboard. This replaced the image of Izuku with a video of Jiro during the collar experiment. He's actually playing it. Jiro thought horrified on what everyone was about to witness. The staff of UA, the students and everybody was horrified as they watched a video of Izuku with his face blurred into a black mess and placed a collar around Jiro's neck as she remained still. This is my favorite part. Izuku said his voice playing over the video. Just as he said that Jiro began screaming at the top of her lungs. Everyone witnessed as it was better for him to stop the pain. Everyone stood horrified as they watched. Even the battle-hardened heroes who had witnessed blood murder and bombings from villains were struggling to keep their lunches in, some even failed. After five minutes the video stopped. You know I must say out of everyone I've heard cry and scream their hearts out, she was the queen of them all. 
Izuku said, as he was able to see All Might's face contorted into an expression of anger worse than the USJ. At this point Jiro had tears staining her cheeks. She didn't want anyone to witness that. She had worked to keep up an image of herself that she and everyone liked. And now everyone had to witness her at her lowest. I promise you villain that I will find you and throw you into Tartarus myself. All Might swore as Izuku just laughed. We will see. Izuku taunted. Although I would advise against continuing to search for me. Or otherwise a little early Christmas present I left for you won't deck the halls with boughs of holly. Izuku warned me about holding up a remote. Every hero in UA went into a warning more at that now knowing there was a bomb planted somewhere dangerous. Well anyways I gotta go so I leave you this final warning. Do not try and look for me. Goodbye. Izuku said forcefully before cutting off his transmission, as the screen switched back to the figure of All Might with his face showing concern, anger, and fear. Hopefully they listen this time. Izuku said before shutting his computer down. Well best not keep the Scream Queen waiting should I. Humming slightly, Izuku was walking back to his lab. His broadcast had worked better than he hoped. He still found it stupid that the heroes hadn't taken his first warning to not look for him. But on the bright side of giving him the pleasure of witnessing their reactions to his bomb remote. And he couldn't wait to see the looks on their faces when they realized there is no bomb. An easy bluff that can't be taken seriously, but can't be taken lightly either. Plus it was hilarious to both see All Might admit his failure in saving Jiro and Sweat to get her back and drag him to Tartarus in the same broadcast. Wonder if the sedatives in the compound have taken effect yet. Izuku mumbles to himself as he inputs his code and renters the lab. There he sees the sleeping body of Jiro. Even though she was asleep he could still feel the sadness and anger coming off of her being directed at him. However he didn't fail to notice the tear stains on her face. Note to self, don't use the screen method on her. Izuku mentally wrote it down. Well can't keep her in the chair like that, Izuku began talking to himself. But where to put her? In reality his base didn't have many rooms. Sure there were his and Iri's rooms, but those were the only bedrooms. His lab was made from eight rooms having their walls and ceilings taken down to make one large complex that took up one-eighth of the building. Coupled with the kitchen, his living room, his unmentionable room, and his storage room every room in the house was being used. So after a careful hour of non-stop mumbling and debating with himself, Izuku finally made his decision. Why not just let her use his room? She had the collar on her neck which, after another large sum of money, seriously now he gets why villains rob banks non-stop, has an electroshock feature. So let's just say any attempt to escape injure expose him will result in, well a lot of pain with what else the collar has in it. Who knows maybe this will work out in my favor. Izuku murmured as he undid the restraints on Jiro and picked her up. Surprisingly she was light enough for him to walk at normal speed. Plus he wasn't about to seem like a sex-driven animal, she did have what he considered the perfect figure. As Izuku walked out of the lab and to his room he noticed Hiri was watching him. Well this was about to be an awkward conversation with a six-year-old. Sure she was used to him having people brought in to experiment on. But he had never actually let one of them live unless it was for the occasional reminder that he was not to be trifled with. Entering his room he put Jiro down on his king-size bed. Just because he's a villain doesn't mean he has to sleep on the floor or couch. He has his own standards. Approximately $3,000 worth of standards Jiro was now laying on, but still they were standards. As he left Jiro to sleep on his bed he exited his room. Only to come face to face with Eri after shutting the door. Yes Eri? Izuku asked, slightly nervous, not knowing what his white-haired daughter was going to ask. Are you letting her live? Eri asked, giving Izuku a look. Yes, Izuku said sheepishly. I can't just go kill every test subject. Tell that to the other 108 subjects since I've been here. Hiri retorted, having kept count. Wait, you've been counting. Izuku said surprised, as he had records of every test, but hadn't memorized the number. It gets boring around here, Hiri defended. What else is there to do when your lab doesn't hold sound in that well? Okay so the million dollars he spent on soundproofing that place was now wasted. Regardless, she's more valuable alive than dead. Izuku said, as Hiri just looked at him. Just saying it's odd that you're letting her live, despite the fact of the insurance policies you have. Hiri said, as Izuku facipumped. How many things do I do, and or do you know about? Izuku asked dreading the answer he knew was coming. Everything. Hiri said, as Izuku just sighed. Okay. You're living with me, a toxin-dealing supervillain who has a UA student in their room, Izuku began. I believe that entitles me to a little privacy. Hiri said nothing for a moment before giving her answer. I guess. Hiri pouted. Alright if you want to see her go in. Izuku said, as he re-perked up and hugged his legs before going into his room. 
You know, one would think that after the first few months of eerie living with him, her puppy eyes trick would lose its effect. Heaven help whoever becomes that girl's boyfriend. So, as Izuku led Iri into his room he decided he had other things to do. And by other things he meant getting a blood sample from a specific quirked individual. So, as Izuku walked back into his lab he was already on the third ring with his contact. How may I be of assistance Mr. Crow? His contact asked over the phone. You're getting slower. Izuku commented on how normally he answered on the first ring. When you're in my line of work one must keep those around them unaware and believing. He said, as he fake coughed. Whatever. Izuku shrugged off the last 40 seconds. Anyways, as I said earlier what may I help you with? He asked. You're well aware of who I have in my possession, correct? Izuku asked. Positive. Jiro Kayoka of Class 1A. His contact answered. I want the file your superiors have on her, Izuku said I want everything. I repeat everything. Message received sir. His contact stuttered out, as he wasn't used to Izuku using his demon voice without the modifier. I'll have it within the next two hours. Clock is ticking. Izuku said before cutting the call. How that man got on his bad side sometimes. But still the fact that he had played the part of his to gain access to all kinds of juicy records was all that mattered. Since Izuku wasn't a hacker or a techno magician, he had to have one of his former allies that he worked with who was a techno freak make it. And by making it he means having over a hundred explosions until it came out perfect. Still with the money he's invested into his enterprise, he had to have things in low places and many friends in high places. Subsequently you wouldn't believe how many government officials want his compounds. Now then, Izuku said, as he opened up the locker and grabbed a lone notebook on the middle shelf of all his compounds. Opening the book it was approximately 60% full. Pretty soon Izuku was busy writing down another 20% of pages worth of information. One would quite literally say that he's a madman when it comes to his notebooks. Sure he had quirk notebooks that he regularly updated. But he was currently first and foremost a scientist. And a very passionate one at that. I mean name one other villain scientist that has single-handedly struck fear into all of the hero society. So if the Y chromosome reacts with the sodium phosphate after mixing with the mixture, then the result becomes Izuku rambled until he decided another 40 pages of formulas and information was enough and returned the notebook to the locker. Wonder how Iri's doing with her? Izuku asked himself as he headed towards his room. And straight to the sound of Iri's laughter. We've checked every floor and every inch of the campus and found nothing. Present Mick said aggravated that they couldn't find the bomb Scarecrow had planted. Everywhere. The classrooms, library, the practice fields, the cafeteria. Pro Hero 13 said, as they were gasping for breath from running. The police search team has found nothing, as well. Detective Namasa said while writing in his notepad. The bomb dogs and search quirk users found nothing either. Is it just me or are you suffering from a lack of panic? Present Mick said. What use would it do for me to panic? It would only impair my reasoning. Namasa said. Besides I believe we aren't taking one important factor into account. Nezu said while sipping a cup of tea. Which would be? Pro Hero Midnight asked. The fact is there have been no further breaches of security prior to the USJ attack, Nezu began. And, as he is currently in possession of one of our students holding the most crucial card over us, Nezu stated, as he was getting looks of confusion. So seeing as we can't do anything to get close to him without risking her safety, Nezu was saying before getting cut off. Safety? Present Mick, Midnight, Power Loader and Lunch Rush said at once. Did we all not witness the video that the bastard played over every TV and radio in Japan? Midnight practically yelled. And at the same time see him hold up a detonator. Present Mick exclaimed. Who said it was a detonator? Eraser had asked. And thus that is how every single hero apart from Eraser Head and Nezu began to question whether or not they should put caffeine in his juice pouches. Okay I'm going to open this door and hopefully not see what I think I'm gonna see. Izuku mentally told himself standing outside of his room. I mean put yourself in his perspective. You just let your daughter go into your room with your test subject for over an hour and didn't watch them. Yeah probably not going into his golden book of best decisions. So taking a deep breath Izuku opened his door. Only to see Iri playing with Jiro on his bed. And both of them seemed like they were having fun. Okay now Izuku was seriously debating on whether or not he could weaponize Iri's adorableness. However both of them were oblivious to his presence, so he just stood there watching them. Until he did the cliché fake cough to get their attention. Which immediately put Jiro in on edge mode. Glad to see you two getting along. Izuku said, as he got opposing looks from the two. And by that he means Iri was upset he interrupted them, and Jiro was still scared of him. What is it this time Iri? Izuku asked, knowing the look she was giving him. You interrupted us. 
Iri said, as Izuku just sighed. Am I not welcome in my room? Izuku asked, as Jiro just looked at the two uncertain what she should do. After staring for 15 minutes you're not. Iri said, as Izuku mentally fascipened. Note to self, make sure Iri cannot see you when eavesdropping. Izuku mentally said, writing another note. Even still it's my room. Izuku defended. Which I helped decorate for you after learning you slept on a couch before I came in. Iri said recalling her first month here helping him actually live like a normal person. Forgot about that, Izuku said to himself low enough for only him to hear. Besides the point. And I helped you decorate the rest of the place like you were planning for months. Iri continued. I was going to get to that eventually. Izuku said. But that was all you. I also helped you learn to cook. Iri interrupted. I was fine with just instant ramen. Izuku said. Apart from that, and sandwich stuff you had nothing else. Iri said. Okay are we sure this girl was raised by a pretty much abusive guardian or a politician? Were you raised by a politician? Izuku asked since Iri was 6, and was not only counteracting him with more skill than most lawyers he knew. Overhaul met with a few before you took me. Iri said. That explains it. Izuku mentally said. Again regardless I just said it was good to see the two of you bonding. Izuku said, bringing the conversation back to its original point. Okay now Jiro was more confused than scared. One thing she was currently seeing of him was contradicting the demented scientist that put this collar on her. Looking at them now it reminded her of her class. Plus it was actually kind of funny to see Scarecrow and Iri bicker like an old married couple, but keeping the father-daughter bond. She actually felt more at ease as they were doing that. Sadly it was cut short by Iri agreeing to go play in her room to leave the two alone. Sorry about that. Izuku apologized and now is talking in a more professional tone. This left Jiro unable to talk. The last thing she expected from him was to apologize. Well that, and the fact that she couldn't talk with the needles still in her throat. However I'm afraid that I need you back in my lab. Okay now she was scared again. Reluctantly Jiro followed Scarecrow back to his lab. It wasn't like she really had a choice since the collar was still on with the needles injected. She was really hating this thing right now too. Not only was it already painful just to move her neck, but she couldn't even talk. So, as she entered the lab she was surprised when Scarecrow asked her to lay back in the chair. Um now it won't be that bad, he said, as he stepped aside to let her walk through. Plus I won't use the restraints if you behave. Well what choice did she have? Well at least he said he wasn't going to use the restraints on her. She still had a few tears from when she was struggling to get out of them. So again she reluctantly laid back down onto the chair, and true to his words, Scarecrow did not put the restraints on her. She breathed a sigh of relief. Now then I take it the needles are still hurting. He asked her. Hold up your right hand for yes, and left hand for no. Jiro raised her right hand. All right then. He said, as he pressed a button on the remote, and Jiro felt the needles retract back into the collar. The feeling of it was, well let's just say it was a few moments of hell before relief washed over her. Of course after the pain of when the collar was first put on her it was really nothing. Now then I would currently advise against talking for an hour. Scarecrow warned her, as he was setting the remote down. Giro's eyes followed him, as he walked across the lab toward a locker. After he opened it he seemed to get enveloped in looking for something. So Jiro had two options to choose from. On one hand she could continue to lay here and go through whatever else the villain had in store for her. On the other she could make a break for what was obviously her caller's control remote. After a few seconds she decided she would make a break for the remote. Also just a word to the wise your caller has a remote shock feature. Scarecrow said from here he was rummaging. Okay now she was scared again. This collar around her neck was electric. Why was he just now telling her this? Did he get his kicks from watching her squirm? Actually that would make sense since he broadcasted her suffering during the last experiment on her. Just as she was about to screw it and lash out at him in an attempt to get away, he came back over. As he set what he was carrying down on the table he grabbed her collar remote. Now then for this to work I'm going to need to put you under. Scarecrow said, as he grabbed a syringe filled with his sedative compound. Jiro tried to back up, but found she was still on the chair. And by the time she was getting up he already had the syringe on her neck, and she instantly fell asleep. Good. Glad to see compound CKO285 works. He said before he took out his phone again. Almost immediately it was answered. Time's up. Everyone was on edge at UA. After it was deemed there was no bomb, and after searching every person and place people were starting to relax a little. That was until the matter of finding Jiro and keeping everyone safe came back up. A few of the heroes who had been called that didn't work for UA wanted to just storm the city and find them. While others wanted to respect his threat since he seemed to be following what he said he would do. 
and a few, one in particular didn't want anything to do with the operation and just came to keep up his rep. What is your opinion on the matter of Endeavor? Nezu asked the man with flames coming off of his body. The man in question, the number 2 pro hero Endeavor aka Enji Todoroki, just grunted in response. In my opinion this is a waste of time. He said blatantly and not sugarcoating everything. The people in the room were taken aback by his reply. A student at their school, a hero in training at that, was being held captive by a villain who broadcasted her screaming in pain while being experimented on. And he says this is a waste of time. He's lucky they had better things to do rather than kick his sorry ass. How can you say that? We have a student being held hostage here. Midnight screamed at him. They did still have time to yell at him though. I have to agree. Thirteen said, but much more calmly. Judging from the small clip that was played it appears she is currently undergoing torture from this villain. It's her fault for being captured. Endeavor said grunting. Okay now people were starting to get ticked at him. Especially Erasure Head. Who did what nobody would expect and used his capture gear on Endeavor. Listen here you smug bastard. Erasure Head said growling. This villain does not joke around. I was in the hospital for over a month from my first encounter with him. So if you think I will just stand idly by and let one of my students be a lab rat for this villain, then you better have another damned idea coming. Endeavor merely growled and grabbed Erasure Head's capture gear, but it was quickly snatched back by Erasure Head. Just as it seemed the two were going to kill each other, a phone in the room went off. Excuse me, I have to take this. Present Mick said. It's personal. As Nezu nodded and shooed him out of the room, he returned to the issue of Erasure Head versus Endeavor. Um now we are all heroes here so let's act like it. Nezu said, trying to calm the two down. Erasure Head sighed and nodded in agreement with Endeavor just grunting and crossing his arms. Now then both of you please apologize so we may move on. Nezu asked as the two pro heroes looked at each other. Naturally Erasure Head was the one to apologize properly while Endeavor just gave his usual style of remark. So with both of them no longer trying to kill each other, the topic of the room returned to the plan on how to rescue Jiro from Scarecrow. However little did they know he was hearing everything said in the room. Izuku was currently moving about his lab. He had so much to do in so little time to get them done. He had roughly about one hour until Jiro woke up and he wasn't about to waste it. Plus now he had her file from his contact. He also had the conversation going on in the hero meeting being recorded for him to listen to later. He actually found it funny that the heroes were so careless as to not remove phones from the room they were meeting in. But back on the subject of Jiro and her file he was rather impressed. Student number 12 in her class. Rank 17 in Erasure Head's quirk apprehension test. And is currently number 7 in class A's grades. He even had information on her parents and her quirk. Shares quirk earphone jack with mother. Izuku muttered to himself as he was reading her file. Quirk allows her to channel her heartbeat into any object the jacks plug into. Jacks can stretch to a distance of up to 6 meters. Izuku continued. Rather impressive. And quite useful for what the collar is made for. Izuku said, chuckling. Although I already knew what a quirk did, now I have all the details. Izuku was rather happy with what he had. First off he not only had UA at his mercy, as they couldn't risk the safety of his hostage, lest it tarnish their reputation. They were even so careless to not know they had a little wolf in the sheep's clothing. I wonder if they called my bluff yet. Izuku said to himself, as he walked back over to Jiro in the chair and pressed a button on the collar. In all honesty he made up the bluff on the fly just to keep up the appearance of being a mastermind and scare everyone. But he could dawdle on that later, as he was currently looking at Jiro from head to toe for the second time. He did have to give it to her since she had a decent figure. In all honesty he didn't follow the bigger is better rule for women's cough cough assets. Plus her hero suit did give off a rocker vibe. However, just as he lost track of time admiring her, she started stirring awake. Deciding it was best to not get caught staring he simply grabbed one of his notebooks and acted like he was preparing to take notes. What happened? Jiro asked, rubbing her eyes before realizing she just talked. Vocal capabilities are normal. Izuku muttered, writing down his first observation. Now then do you feel anything unusual? Izuku asked as Jiro shook her head. Okay. So far so good. Izuku muttered. Now then if you would please follow me. Izuku basically ordered. Hiro followed him as they left the lab. What surprised her was the fact they were going outside. She once again debated on escape but decided against it. While she didn't like being a hostage, she really didn't like the thought of going through the pain again. So after five minutes of walking they arrived outside and into an alleyway not letting her see the surrounding area. Great. Jiro internally groaned. Now then if I understand correctly your quirk allows you to channel your heartbeat into whatever your jacks are plugged into. Izuku asked, shocking Jiro. 
How the hell does he know what my quirk does? Jiro screamed in her head, surprised. Yeah. She said sheepishly. Alright then. Izuku said, writing something down in his notebook. Now if you may, please plug your jacks into the ports on the collar. Wait there are ports on this thing. Jiro said in her head. Okay Jiro said, as she plugged in her jacks. She felt a slight sting in her throat when she did that, but it wasn't painful. Alright then pump your heartbeat into it. Izuku said, using his pen to point at a dumpster about 50 feet down the alley. Okay now Jiro was very concerned. If she pumped her heartbeat into this collar what would happen? Did the thing have any release mechanism? Or would it explode? She didn't want to find out. What's supposed to happen? Jiro asked, trying to sound calm. Oh right I forgot. Izuku said, as he grabbed the remote and pressed the button on it again. Only this time when the needles pierced into her neck they didn't hurt, but felt rather natural. In truth she wouldn't mind having them like this apart from the fact that they were needles inside her throat. And I just pumped my heartbeat into it. Jiro asked nervously. Either that or enough wattage to put a normal person into a coma. Izuku said, holding his finger dangerously close to the yellow button with an electric bolt symbol. Helping Jiro decided to do it. Okay. She said before she used her quirk. The feeling she felt when her heartbeat entered her throat was something surprising. What she was expecting was pain, she instead felt the inside of her voice box vibrating. It was a tingling sensation, the itch you couldn't scratch. She felt the urge to release the feeling in her throat. The only way she could think of doing that was to open her mouth. But would that work? She had to try at least, will either that or enough electricity to put her in a coma. So opening her mouth she was surprised when a stream of sound waves were emitted from her mouth and slammed straight into where Izuku pointed, creating a large hole in the alley wall and continuing to chip at the bricks. Stop. Izuku said loud enough for her to hear over the sound of her quirk. When she stopped she immediately felt different. When she had her quirk active she felt a rush of adrenaline in her system. She didn't feel pain like she thought she would. Instead of going along with the rush of energy she felt like a different person. I must say I'm impressed the insulin compound worked. Izuku admitted to her. What is he talking about? Jiro asked herself internally. Well all that matters is that it works. Izuku said, closing his book. Now then a more pressing concern to address. Izuku said, facing Jiro. What would that be? Jiro asked nervously. Izuku just smiled creepily at her question, as the cloud overcast made the lighting on his face disappear, masking it. Whether or not you decide to join me. Okay this day was officially getting weird for Jiro. First off she not only gets kidnapped by the villain Scarecrow. Then she gets this bloody collar put on her making her go through hours of pain. Then she finds out it was recorded and then broadcast to every screen and radio in Japan. Next she wakes up in the villain's room with his daughter trying to make conversation with her, which was in her opinion the weirdest part of her day. And when she thought it couldn't get even weirder it turns out she can pump her heartbeat into her voice box to shoot sound waves out of her mouth. And now after all of this, he's asking her to join him. Her hero in training joins forces and work for one of the current most dangerous villains. The same one who hospitalized her homeroom teacher and the one who is currently responsible for the most hero deaths. He wants me to join him. Jiro thought dumbstruck. You know a normal person would have either passed out or fainted right now. And she was currently about 90% until she did. Clock is ticking. Izuku said tapping the shock button, but not pressing it. He's not really going to let me say no is he? Jiro basically asked and answered her own question. Okay seeing as how you're quiet this is the deal, Izuku said getting her attention. I'm sure you're smart enough to know I'm not going to take a no for an answer. So you can either do this willingly, or I can force you to do it. Well that certainly didn't make her feel better. So either she goes through torture to make her do what he wants, like a dog with a shock collar. Or she can do whatever it is he wants her to do willingly and possibly not be tortured more. What to pick, what to pick. Your answer? Izuku asks, slowly moving his thumb closer to the shock button. I'll do it. Jiro blurted out almost instinctively before gasping at what she said. Izuku however just smiled. He was hoping that she would pick that option. It would make things just that little bit easier and sweeter for him later down the line. Now for the final step. Right answer. Izuku said before pressing the button he was hovering his thumb over. Instantly Jiro felt the needle stab back into her. She dropped to her knees clutching her head in pain as she felt electricity surge through her body. Please just bear through it. Izuku asked as he knelt down in front of her. I promise you if you behave this is the last time I'll be doing this. Izuku said as he looked into her eyes. Hiro just grit her teeth trying to make a menacing look, Izuku just smiled at that. You know that only makes you look more adorable. Izuku coaxed Jiro off guard. Did he just compliment me? Jiro asked herself while trying to not scream from the pain. That was before it stopped. 
Looking up she saw that Izuku had pressed a button again. All done. Izuku said smiling before helping Jiro up. He's being nice to me. Jiro said in her head and then remembered his previous comment. He actually said she looked adorable. Not even Mineta complimented her on that and he was an absolute perv who spent like 90% of his time staring at the other girl's assets. But the guy who's been subjecting her to nothing but pain, experiments and threats was the one that complimented her. She actually felt a slight blush at that since she was hardly ever complimented. Who knows maybe she could make the time she was stuck with him decent until she was rescued. Thanks. Jiro said, trying to be nice. Izuku just smirked before replying. What kind of boss would I be if I wasn't nice to my only worker? Izuku said. But all of the teachers of UA were in the principal's office. A lone figure was creeping through the halls. He just had to take the job of getting the stuff Scarecrow asked for. It wasn't enough that he was undercover at UA, but now he had to get a fucking blood sample for him. Good grief he picked a bad time to take the job. He just had to call while I was with them. The person groaned as they were approaching a form in the hallway. Alright just take a right here and there we go. He said as he took a turn and found the file room of UA. He had already been here once today to get the file on the student scarecrow kidnapped. And now he's requesting a blood sample from another quirked individual of a specific type. Fortunately he knew just that individual. Of course whether or not a blood sample was in UA was a different story. Of course he knew where one would be if need be and he had the contacts to get it. But right now he had to look here. Of course he could always just get a sample from her, but that was the last thing he wanted to do right now. It would be too suspicious. Of course if under the right conditions it wouldn't be. But he could ponder that later. Let's see if I was a blood sample in UA where would I be? He asked himself as he looked around the dormant file room. Luckily the cameras and all were indisposed of, so he didn't need to worry about it. But it was just his luck they didn't have a single damn blood sample here. You know I don't know what I was thinking. He chastised himself. Sighing he decided he needed to make a quick break and get clear. He knew how suspicious it would be if he was caught here and he didn't want to go through that scuffle. Hopefully the others aren't suspicious yet. He signed as he left the room. After the conflict of Erasure Head versus Endeavor had died down, people returned back to the matter of Jiro's rescue. Of course they were still bickering whether to ignore his warning and just storm every inch of the surrounding area or just play it by ear and hope for the best. Of course there were a few who wanted to say the logical thing, but not even if present Mick used his quirk, they would be able to be louder than them. So 13 was the one who we used to speak up. Look when everything comes down we are still at his mercy. 13 said, as everyone turned to look at them. What I mean is that the Scarecrow has proven to not only be able to defeat Erase Your Head in combat, but also able to outsmart All Might. Before someone could counteract them present Mick walked back in the room. Sorry that it was a personal call. He said, as he pocketed his phone. Not a problem at all. Nezu said, taking a sip of tea. We're still making rescue plans. So what do we have so far? Present Mick asked. But we can't do anything without risking the student safety. Power Loaded said. Well then. Present Mick said, as the room once again divulged into chatter. Even he had to admit that this was too loud for his liking. Plus he couldn't really make any words out from around him. So he didn't notice it when Midnight appeared beside him. Personal call huh? She asked, catching him off guard. Yeah. Personal. Present Mick said slightly startled. So who's the lucky girl? Midnight asked straight to the point. Present Mick seemed reluctant to answer that question to the point of beads of sweat appearing on his forehead. Nobody. He said defensively which seemed to strike a chord with Midnight. Okay don't have to tell me. She said as she walked away. Currently Jiro was in the scarecrow lab as his assistant. So far all she's had to do is hand him whatever he asks for. And so far since the first time he hasn't shocked her once. She had to admit though the guy was smart for being her age. Plus the lab had to have cost a fortune. She was pretty sure he had everything science and chemistry related here. Plus when she isn't being strapped to a chair and having chemicals injected into her, she actually found it interesting to see everything around. But apart from that she was still scared of him. Why show her B, he has the shock remote on him at all times. He thought that the first one was to show her that she couldn't do anything against him. And she couldn't, she was no master pickpocket or fighter. Speaking of that he told her why he put the collar on her. Apparently she had the perfect quirk to go along with the collar. So now she basically has a super quirk. We're done here for today. Izuku said, snapping Jiro out of her train of thought. Okay. Jiro stuttered. For some reason she couldn't help but do that around him. Follow me. Izuku ordered as they walked out of the lab. And straight to the room Izuku always kept locked and eerie away from. For some reason Joel's blood ran cold as they stopped in front of it. 
She had a sense of fear running through her that she shouldn't go in. Like all people in horror movies tend to ignore and go in anyway. Fair warning, Izuku began as he fished an old rustic looking key out of his glove. Yes it was hidden inside of his gloves. Other than me you're the only one to come in here and be allowed to come out. He said as he put the key in the padlock and turned it. As soon as the door opened the smell of blood flooded Jiro's nose. She instantly gagged at the smell and tried to cover it. Alive. Izuku stated as he dragged her into the room and shut the door. She couldn't see anything. All she could smell was the stench of blood. Then light flooded the room as Izuku flipped a switch. And she instantly wished for the darkness to return. Do you like my artwork? Izuku asked her as she started to have trouble breathing. All around the room there were bodies strewn everywhere. Some were hanging in nooses from the ceiling and looked like they tried to claw their way out. Others were covered in cuts and missing limbs. Some seemed like they chose themselves to death as evident by their hands squeezing their throats. And a few were even on a guillotine and missing heads. But one theme that numbed them all was the blood oozing through every opening on their body, the faces frozen in place like they were screaming, and the veins. They had visible veins on them and they were all a sickly green color. What the fuck is this? Jiro managed to get out. This is where I put those who sample my, oh how shall I word this, Izuku said pondering. My unstable and prototype compounds. Izuku wasn't lying either. He had this room built for other reasons too. And of course a little music every once and a while. Izuku said snickering. Jiro on the other hand was struggling to keep herself together. She thought she had sent through unbearable torture when the collar was put on her. But everyone here seemed like their ends were slow and painful. Jiro was about to vomit until she felt something drip onto her forehead. As she looked up she felt her stomach wrench even more. On the ceiling more bodies were strewn there. She was surprised she missed them until she saw that some of them were eviscerated. In fact there were some that couldn't even be considered bodies, but just limbs. And the ceiling looked like it was intentionally painted red, but no, it was just covered in blood. Organs were just hanging from them too. It looked like streamers if they were made of intestines, stomachs, lungs, hearts, livers and kidneys. So what do you think? Izuku asked again, but this time behind her. What the fuck? Was all she could mutter out. Don't be like that, Izuku said slowly stroking her arm. The moment he touched her a tingling feeling went through her body. Trust me my dear, you just haven't experienced the thrill yet, Izuku continued, as she was in his grasp too shocked to move or do anything. When you get past the blood guts and organs the feeling of what you experience is quite ravishing. Okay this was fucked up. Like a whole new level of fucked. First off he was not only holding her, but it just stroked her arm while talking in her ear. She didn't know if that was to be creepy af or, no not going to think of that. Secondly he led her to a room filled with tucking corpses and medieval torture devices. And third is that he's telling her the experience is ravishing. Seriously this situation can't possibly get more fucked up. Don't worry I won't subject you to this. Izuku said, as Jiro was now struggling to breathe. She was hyperventilating like crazy. And her eyes could barely get any bigger. And literally had no words for this situation. But that doesn't mean you won't. Izuku said, as she found herself now in front of a rack. And there was a still alive person. Only he had the same green veins and was covered in blood. You see, here's the deal. I want you to off him however you please, Izuku said. Or I will end him myself and put you in his place, but you won't be so fortunate as to have the release of death on your side. Izuku finished. Nope now it's more fucked up. Jiro was about to do something, anything to get out of the situation. That was until she felt something enter her hands. Looking down, Izuku had placed a mace in her hands. Now then I'm going to go get something ready. Izuku started as he began walking away to the exit door. By the time I'm back he wouldn't be breathing or he should be in extreme pain. Izuku continued as he began unlocking the inside of the door. One more thing in case morals get in your way. He's guilty for five murders and all of them a family. Izuku finished as the door was shut and locked again leaving Jiro in there. Looking down at the object in her hands she knew what he gave it to her for. Please. The man in the rack suddenly rasped out catching Jiro off guard. Please spare me. He begged not wanting to die. Jiro however was having a difficult choice. Right now she either had to kill him herself or let Scarecrow kill him and he tortured herself in return. Basically it's a matter of whether or not she wanted to commit murder or suffer. But would it matter? He was going to die anyway, so why should she suffer for her not killing him when regardless he would die? And then it hit her would anyone truly care if he died? Would anyone notice a difference if he wasn't around? Besides in a way this was his commutants for killing a family. In a way Jiro did it as a form of justice, he sowed death and now he would reap his death. Gritting her teeth and trying not to think hard about it, Jiro increased her trip on the handle of the mace. 
and then without warning, slung it with all her might into the man's chest. Almost instantly she felt blood on her hands, and a little on her body, and face. Anne was also even able to hear the cracking of the man's bones. But the scream of pain he let out. She just has been going insane, as Scarecrow himself while she's been here. Because the screams of the man were like music. Coming from a musical family herself, she had to admit that his screams were the finest she's heard. Anne wanted to hear it louder. And what better way to do it than to keep beating him. After another five swings Jiro found her hero uniform splattered with blood. The black white and pink of her outfit now seems like it was red with various splotches of the mentioned colors. And only then did she register, with blood coating her body and clothes, as the man had long since ushered his final breath did she get it. She felt alive, like she never had before. She felt like a bird released from its cage, an animal set free into the wild. Even more so the blood no longer possessed the stench that made her stomach churn. Instead it had a pleasant scent that she enjoyed. To her it smelt like a field of roses. Of course she much rather loved the smell of freshly bought and polished instruments, but roses were fine. She even became so enveloped that she didn't notice the door opening and Izuku walking in. And holding something in his hands. You pass. Izuku said standing in front of her, as she looked up from her blood-stained hands. I what? She asked. You passed the test. Izuku said, as he gave her the box wrapped in paper. And here's your present. Although I would suggest a shower before opening it him. He said, as he gestured to her blossomed attire. Lead the way. Jiro said, as Izuku nodded and led her out of the room. Anne went straight into the bathroom connected to his bedroom. So one rather long shower later, and a busy time critiquing his choices in hair care and shampoo, did not realize her. She had killed somebody. She not only witnessed someone do it, but she did it at her own hands. But the eyes he thought were she didn't feel guilty about it. But she was a hero in training, a person who was supposed to stop murders from happening. And now here she was showering the blood of her first victim off of her in the bathroom of a most wanted villain that had kidnapped her and whom she now worked for. God how could this day get weirder? You know what not every time she's either said or asked herself that it does. So, as she stepped out of the shower she found herself wondering what she was supposed to wear. But before she freaked out she noticed the box on the counter in the bathroom. With a note that reads as follows. Congratulations on your first kill. I'm happy to say that you surpassed what I expected of you. Now I'm sure right now you're wondering what to wear or whatever. I don't really know. But, as a reward your new outfit is in the box, along with a few other things to make you feel welcome. Enjoy. Yours truly. MR.C. P.S. Before you get any ideas the collar is waterproof and won't short circuit. Just informing you. I don't know whether or not I should be concerned. Jiro asked herself as she opened the box. Inside the top was a thing of white makeup and dark purple lipstick. Under the rag she found a large shipping package that looked like it was mailed off of Amazon. And under that Jiro found another small box. With another note. Before you try anything the phone will only accept stuff I allow on it. All no calling for a rescue or friends. Music and all that other jibber jabber I don't care about. Don't make me regret this. MR.C. Before she could dwindle on that she had already opened the large package. And inside was what looked like a large cloak. However it seemed like it was semi-skin tight and would most likely exaggerate her features. But it still looked good. But before she tried it on she noticed a name stitched into the back of the hood at the collar level. Scream Queen. Okay Jiro had to admit this thing was comfy as hell. It was for her body like a glove and was her exact size. Which begged the question on how the freak scarecrow knew her exact size. Which she was surprisingly less concerned with than she should be. But it looked great on her. After the makeup and lip gloss she had to admit she looked good. Or more precisely she looked like a ghoul or a witch. But it hit her collar and most of her face. Still though why scream queen? Jiro asked herself as she further looked in the mirror. It just puzzled her that he had given her that name. Anne had no intention of asking the last three results be unwanted. At least it sounds kinda scary. What? If she's going to work with a villain who calls himself Scarecrow, she can at least make sure her name sounds related and scary at the same time. So after finally being satisfied with her appearance she then turned to the other thing he had given her. Apparently he had this phone made specifically so it couldn't be tracked hacked or reprogrammed. So she was pretty much stuck with games and music to use. At least it's something. Jiro said, as she found a pocket in her outfit and put the phone into it. Walking out of the bathroom she was surprised when he reappeared and hugged her. And by hugging her she meant jumped at her from nowhere and latched onto her. You're alive. Eerie said, as she was currently off the ground and hanging off Jiro's waist. Why wouldn't I be? Jiro asked her, as she attempted to pry the surprisingly vice-like grip girl off of her. Other than me you're the only one he's let come in here and survive. 
Iri said, as she let go. Plus your outfit looks awesome. God why does this child have to look this cute? Jiro mentally asked herself, as Yuri was holding her thumb up in approval of Jiro's outfit, and making her face to where her cheeks puffed out. Again it's great to see you two getting along. Izuku said, as he was leaning on his open door holding his father's large side, and tilting it back and forth. Okay when the hell did he get here? Jiro shouted internally. Even, as brash as she was, she wouldn't say that out loud for two reasons. One being that doing that would be a surefire way to get her in a bad situation with him. Two being that the girl clinging to her leg was too innocent to talk like that in front of. Or at least she wouldn't be the one to say it first. Izuku meanwhile was busy admiring Jiro in her new outfit. He had to admit he was slightly being turned on by it. They took for her perfectly. Although when you have her every size and dimension on a file you bought from a person you didn't know it was really all too easy. The only hard part was getting it made, inspected, and delivered in a short two-hour period. But it appeared to have been worth it. Nearly every feature of her had been defined in the outfit perfectly. It wasn't too baggy to be a problem when moving, but it wasn't a fight to be considered a bodysuit. Her hips were perfectly defined and paired well with her upper body. She was able to make the longer sleeves and leg pieces look good. He would be lying if he said she wasn't beautiful in her current appearance. Plus she had the personality to boot. He may or may not have been watching and possibly recording her experience in his relaxation room. Although this one he had no intentions of airing publicly. Or at least he wants to be the one to decide that. Of course he would wait before asking since she's barely worked for him a day and he'd rather wait until she was committed. Plus it was actually funny to see Eri latch on to someone other than him. Believe him when he says that girl can easily overpower anyone in multiple different ways. That being said, he didn't want to think of seeing them recently. However, as he was about to talk some more his phone vibrated. Time and place. The person on the other end said, as Izuku just smiled. Despite how shaken up the teachers were from the recent attack, it was almost as much as the students were. Specifically Momo Yaoi Rozu. She had been the only one conscious enough to remember what had happened between herself and Jiro with Scarecrow. She hated to say it, but he lived up to all the hype and rep. Even when she first saw him her blood froze. And if that wasn't a bad sign already then the video of Jiro being tortured was. I still can't believe this. Yuraka said, as nearly all of class A was just outside UA. The only people absent were Kaminari, Ajiro, Mineta, Koda, Bakugo, and Tokoyami. Yes I find it hard to process this. Lita said. The A especially after that video. Kirishima said. Please don't mention that again. Mina said still shaken from that video. Sorry. Kirishima apologized. Everybody got quiet after that. Even though few of them were there when Jiro was taken, they could only guess how scary it was. Everyone knew what this villain was capable of now more than ever. Not only had he severely hospitalized Erasure Head a few months ago, but now he had also been able to defeat All Might. Not physically, but in a game of wits. Because if All Might tried anything then Jiro's life would be forfeit, and if he didn't do what he was told to, and publicly discredit himself, then her life was forfeit. For once someone had done it, they had All Might in their hands like a puppet. Everyone was so zoned out they didn't notice when Kaminari walked over. Hey guys. He said meekly, as he was rubbing his arm which had bandages wrapped around it. Hey. Most of them replied. Kaminari just joined Kirishima, and Todoroki leaned against the wall. Everybody continued to stay quiet and keep to themselves. That was until they saw Erasure Head walking towards them. However they merely looked up to acknowledge his existence before sulking again. I know how you feel. He said, as they looked at him. To lose a friend close to you at the hands of a villain and watch them as they suffer, he continued with his voice filled with remorse. But understand we will do what we can. As far as we know Scarecrow will follow what he says if we do. He said, as everyone still looked at him, although some perked up slightly. So, as of currently, while we don't know what pain Jiro is currently going through, we do know she's alive. In the next few moments Erasure Head saw the one sad and sorrowful faces worn by many of his students, morph slightly into expressions of hope and determination. Now stop sulking and follow me. He said, as everyone just gave him a shocked look. What did you really think that we wouldn't be doing anything to prepare you in case this happens again? He said, as he flashed his typical smug smirk. In reality he was just trying to get their minds off of the situation. So he may or may not have gotten an excuse to use the training grounds for a small sparring tournament. Now let's just hope everything else goes, as planned. The meeting of the rescue operation had concluded abruptly. It was a consecutive decision that the present heroes and police would be on the lookout for anything related to the Scarecrow, and that they would be on guard for other attacks. As many of the heroes who didn't work in UA left, and a few that did were returning to their respective departments, Erasure had approached Nezu who was busy sipping tea again. 
Yes is Awa. Nezu asked, putting his team down. I would like permission for those in my class to use the training grounds. Erasure Head asked straight to the point. My my, what a request. Nezu jokes. Any reason? Erasure Head sighed before giving his response. I feel that they are beating themselves up over what happened, Erasure Head began. I feel that for mental health that it would be beneficial to take their minds off of the situation. Nezu smirked as he rubbed his chin. Any ideas on what to do? He asked. I was considering that one-on-one -on -one matches against each other would help them in the use of their quirks and combat experience, Erasure Head said. As well as that it would improve their relations and prepare them for the sports festival coming up. Interesting idea Azawa, Nezu started before taking another drink of tea. Well I believe that this is one of our more dire situations, I feel that it would indeed prove beneficial to get the student's mind off of this. So I'm approved. Erasure Head said. You are. However I expect you to be watching them at all times. Nezu said. I will. Everything would have gone fine if I didn't invite that brat. Shigaraki raged as he disintegrated the table he slammed his hands on. Right now the term hell hath no fury was pretty accurate. He was fine after losing Nomu, that was a minor loss after the brat had come bearing a hostage. Then he was ecstatic when All Might was going to publicly discredit himself. It was like one of his best dreams come true. But then when he's doing the broadcast the brat had to not only make the league look bad, but try to one-up them. Now that ticked him off on so many levels. Please Shigaraki calm down. Kurajiri pleaded as he was frantically trying to keep his precious bar intact. Calm down. You want me to calm down. Shigaraki screamed as he threw a glass that Kurajiri barely dodged. I thought All Might discrediting himself was what you desired. Kurajiri said as he began warping all the glasses near Shigaraki to the back storage room, not wanting more to get broken. Not when it discredits me. Shigaraki yelled as he prepared to throw a barstool in rage. Please Tamura, it is not wise to do this to yourself. The voice of All for One said through the monitor. As soon as his master spoke, Shigaraki froze and looked at him. The rage was evident enough in the fact that his eyes were shaking in place. And the fact that shards of broken glass and wood as well as dust was everywhere in the bar as Kurajiri was frantically trying to clean up while he had the chance. I understand your anger Tamura, but lashing out and destroying everything and everyone around you will not solve it. All for one said in a calming tone as Shigaraki slowly calmed down. But the Nomu, everyone that I took. All the pawns I gathered. Shigaraki said in the most polite voice he could muster. Acceptable losses. We have more Nomus, and the game only ends when the king is captured. All for one said as Shigaraki looked at the monitor. You're the king Shigaraki. The face of the league, there are more pawns to be found and more plans to be made. All for one continued. While the scarecrow has discredited you do not forget that in just the short time All Might's popularity is dropping. Meaning that while he is trying his best to ensure his student survives, you will be busy continuing your plans. All for one finished as Shigaraki was now more calm and no longer filled with endless rage. Thank you sensei. Shigaraki said as he slumped down on one of the couches in the room. That is my purpose for Shigaraki. To help you grow as both a villain and a leader. All for one said before his transmission was cancelled. Now at the current moment the bar was quiet. The only sound was Shigaraki scratching his neck while deep in thought and Kurajiri as he was busy fixing the bar. At least he didn't ruin my counter. Kurajiri internally said before he heard Shigaraki slam his hands onto something again. I have it. He said gleefully as he removed his hands when he noticed the accidental decaying of Kurajiri's counter. I just had to say it. Currently Izuku was in an old alleyway that was about 5 miles from his base. This was the safest place for him to meet his contact. With hopefully said contact being in possession of the blood sample he requested. If he could get it then he might even be able to make something even more devilish than his fear toxin. Of course the toxin took him months to refine and perfect. So this would probably take a little longer. Of course now that he has a hopeful new partner in his job, he could get it made sooner. Where is he? Izuku said to himself with his mask on. He was quickly growing impatient as the police and heroes were more active since his broadcast and while not looking for him in particular, he didn't feel like fighting them. Just as Izuku was about to get more annoyed, the sound of footsteps from the other end of the alley were heard. Hey how you doing the person asked with a distorted use of themselves. Izuku merely narrowed his eyes on him. In reality this was the first time he was meeting one of his more reliable information gatherers and specialists. But one does not get far in that particular line of work by showing themselves off. Your money. Izuku growled as he tossed a suitcase by his side to the other person. As the suitcase hit the ground it accidentally opened revealing a bunch of $100 bills totaling up to $100,000. 
the other person smiling closes the suitcase and places another container on the ground before sliding it to Izuku. Opening his container Izuku contained five vials of blood. I went ahead and got extra for you. The other person said coyly. Well done. Izuku complimented as he was pleased with the results. I aim to please. The other person said mock bowing into the light, the only thing being revealed was a bandaged arm. Izuku just gave a nod as he closed his container and turned to leave, his contact doing the same. However, as Izuku was leaving he simply smiled knowing the little surprise that was in the money case. Let's see how she does with this. Izuku thought, as once he was soon out of sight, he opened his phone to reveal a map with a blip moving in it. Giro was surprisingly given permission to roam around Scarecrow's Lear base house, whatever he called it. Her only rules were to not go into the room and to not leave. And also make sure Eri was in sight. Which she found to be not difficult at all since she was currently playing with a girl. Jiro was actually taken aback by Eri's room when she saw it. Of all the things she thought would be in the room of the scarecrow's daughter she wasn't expecting this. The walls were painted pink with white stripes. Her bed was at least a queen size with rainbow sheets, and her pillows were all different animal designs on the cases. And then there was the giant corner of the room taken up by beanbags and stuffed animals. There was literally every stuffed animal of every size she could imagine. And was at least two giant bears, a bunch of small rabbits, cats, dogs, and ducks. As well as a bunch of other medium-sized ones like a zebra, lion, put, and either an alligator or a crocodile, she couldn't tell. Then there was the blanket hung a few feet over it that made it look like a small hut. As well as a bunch of blankets inside the literal mass of softness. Then, turning across the room they walked to, they were taken up by a bookshelf filled with every child's book, and an appropriate book for someone Eerie's age could be found. Then next to it was a large table. Now that would be normal if the thing wasn't covered in Legos. And not the large Duplo Legos on no. It was covered completely in the name brand original Legos making a whole city. There were car streets, a crap ton of people, and every possible building conceivable, given the dimensions of a 4 feet by 8 feet table. And then under that table were more bins of Legos. But then the drowning piece of the room. She thought that the corner of absolute plushness and the Lego city was abnormal. Try topping the girl's dollhouse setup. Go ahead and try. You can't. Well who could try topping the second story built into her room that was accused by a slide. Yeah a slide that emptied into the corner of plushies. Then you get to the second floor. Dolls, literally dolls, were everywhere. No exaggeration, they were everywhere. Doll houses were lined up against the walls. Dolls were literally covering the floor. And Jiro is pretty sure the cars had their own parking complex against the car corner of the wall. So what do you think? Eerie asked her, as she was just standing in the entrance of her room. Jiro was once again at a loss for words. Every time she thought she had this place and its inhabitants figured out something new topped her. It's, well it's it's awesome isn't it? Eerie interrupted, her eyes beaming. That's one way of putting it. Jiro said, as she just looked around the room. Eerie in the meanwhile just jumped into her massive pile of stuffed animals and seemingly disappeared into the mass. Then she reappeared near the back in front of one of the giant bears that now had its arms wrapped around her in a protective manner. Come on in. Eerie said as she sunk deeper into the mass. Jiro hesitated for a moment before slowly attempting to trudge through the sea of animals. Pretty soon she was laying next to Eerie as both of them were now looking at each other. See, I told you it was comfy. Eerie said as she was now fiddling with a small rabbit plushie. I guess. Jiro said as she was leaning up against a pile of small, medium-sized animals and blankets. Both of them just sat there making small talk and conversation. However after a while Jiro noticed that Eerie seemed to be inching closer to her. Which she found odd because just from the small time she's known Eerie, she could tell she wasn't the subtle type of person. So why she was trying to be slow and not get noticed when inching closer was a mystery to her. So finally decided that she wanted to know Jiro asked her. You okay? Jiro asked as she turned to look at Eerie who was holding a medium-sized cat plush in her arms. Eerie didn't say anything which prompted Jiro to dig further. You know if you want I can talk. She noticed that Eerie was tightening her grip on her plush. However when Jiro was about to drop the subject Eerie looked at her. And her expression was a kind of sadness, loneliness, joy, happiness, loss you name it. It's just that other than daddy I've never really felt safe around anyone. Eerie said as she recalled the whole ordeal Izuku went through to keep her. Flashback. Izuku, currently in his villain outfit, was in a large white room. He could tell them the room had been sterilized beyond belief by the blatant smell of bleach in the air. He didn't care though since the fumes were harmless against his mask. What he did care about was the person across from the table he was sitting at. Aichisaki, or Overhaul, as he was to be called, was the head of the Yakuza and boss of the thugs he killed. 
who also happened to claim he was Eerie's legal guardian. Yeah I'll believe that when Bakugo doesn't look down on the quirkless. Izuku said in his head, as neither of the two were saying anything. However, despite the silence filling the room, he could feel not only the board coming from overhaul, but the massive wave of power and killing intent. He would be lying if he said it didn't set him on edge. Still though he knew that overhaul wanted something from him, and that was the only reason he was alive. The silence between them was soon broken, as overhaul talked. I must admit knowing that the scarecrow is nothing more than a 15-year-old child surprises me. He said, as his eyes not once lost their analytical look on Izuku. I guess I'm just one full of surprises then. Izuku said, chuckling. Overhaul merely grunted at his comment. I don't however like you killing my men even if they acted on their own. He said, as anger laced his voice. So they were on their own. Great more complications. Izuku internally groaned. And while I deeply apologize for their actions. I must insist that Eri be returned to me. Overhaul said in a more or less demanding tone. Izuku did not reply, but merely contemplated his answer. Anne had it decided. Well I hope for a deal of respect for the Yakuza, I must deny your request. Izuku said, as he immediately felt the hate being fired at him. I'm giving you a second chance worm. Take it. Overhaul said standing up. Izuku barely noticed. I saw her condition, the bandages, the bruises, and her physical and mental state, Izuku began. Quite surprising really considering that the leader of the Yakuza would keep a girl alive like that. Overhaul glared literal blades at Izuku. You know nothing. He said. Maybe. Or perhaps I know a few things. Izuku said standing up. Overhaul then shifted his demeanor towards Izuku to a more businessman-like one. What do you want? He asked, his voice still gravelly. Izuku smirked under his mask for a brief moment. Why wouldn't he, he's about to play the leader of a literal mob for a fool. The girl. Izuku said casually. Absolutely not. Overhaul yelled, slamming his hands down. Why? Izuku asked. I am her guardian. Furthermore she is more valuable to me under my custody. Overhaul said loudly. Izuku stayed silent for a moment before talking again. How does one million sound? Izuku asked, as he stood up. Overhaul's eyebrow twitched at that offer. One million was quite tempting for him, but wouldn't help him with his plans, more than having Eri would. No. Overhaul said, as now both he and Izuku were playing a game of who would crack under the other first. One million, and a free crate of my latest compound. Izuku offered, as he grabbed a vial from a pouch on his waist, and slid it to him. Overhaul carefully picked up the vial so as to not activate his quirk. Still no. Overhaul said, setting the vial down. Two million, and the crate. Izuku said, as Overhaul's hands were now shaking. This kid really knew how to bargain. It seemed that on that front they both were equally matched. Whenever Overhaul denied an offer he immediately made a better one. And since neither of them could read the other's face since they were both wearing masks, albeit only covering his lower face, they were at a standstill. A standstill Overhaul intended to break. Make it three million, and two crates. Overhaul said, as Izuku sighed internally. Deal. Izuku said. Overhaul internally smiled. Sure he just lost Eerie, but in return not only got three million United States dollars, and three crates full of the Scarecrow's toxin. A toxin that he could very easily put to use for his own means. Great. Now leave. Overhaul demanded, as a few Yakuza men entered the room to escort Scarecrow out. Hopefully this was worth it. Izuku said internally hoping he didn't just waste a lot of valuable time, money, and resources. Soon after that he was back at his hideout. After carefully making sure it wasn't bugged and that he wasn't followed he entered the room he put the girl, Eri in. She was emotionless when he looked at her. He had been expecting a cheerful, bubbly, and curious personality. But emotionless was not one of them. But, as soon as he got close to her he recognized the look on her eyes. She's afraid. Izuku said in his head. He's recognized the decrease in pupil size as her vision narrowed on him. He recognized the muscle tense as they braced for pain. And he recognized the other emotion she had, one that he was familiar with other than fear. Almost in a split second Eerie had remembered that story. But she didn't dwell on it. All that came from that were the unpleasant memories of her time with Overhaul. A time she wanted to forget and remove. She wanted to start over, a new life with her daddy Izuku. The first person in forever to make her smile, laugh, and he herself. And then Jiro, she was also one to show her kindness. Regardless of her being startled when waking up in Izuku's room and wearing the collar, she had been polite in recognizing her as the one who healed her injuries. Right now she just wanted to spend forever with both of them. Can you read to me? Iri asked Jiro suddenly, as she looked at the small girl. Why not, after all just finding a book to read to her should be easy. Sure. Any preferences? Jiro asked, as she pulled herself up. 
Eerie thought for a moment before replying. The one with the cat that has a hat. Gero nodded and walked over to the bookshelf. She knew exactly which book to look for and the convenient label and being organized by author also helped. So soon she was reading to Eerie about a brother and sister in a house. And how they couldn't go out in the rain to play, so they stayed inside on all of the dreary days. Then the cat in a hat showed up to liven their mood so they wouldn't just be content to brood. Eerie listened throughout the story, barely recognizing the fact that she was looking conscious quickly. The end. Jiro said, snapping the book shut. She could hardly believe it. She had just read a children's book to Scarecrow's daughter. She was really wondering if the rest of the time she would be like that. She was about to think further into it when she heard snoring. Craving her head Jiro was that Eerie had fallen asleep next to her. And then she felt a wave of exhaustion, but her, as well. What the hell? She said mentally, as she slumped down next to Eerie, as she soon drifted off. After all, what harm could they bring? Well a camera flash could answer that. This is going in my file. The end. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic, link is in the description, see you next time, till then sayonara.